What's up guys? It's your boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If Naruto Conquered the Shinobi World with Shadow Clones Army? Part 2. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. So, small talk was difficult between the civilian and the heavily armored genin that sat together in the room. Neither had much to talk about, and neither could find much to say to even broach a conversation. Neither had much of an idea what the other liked or a safe subject to talk about. The genin wanted to know about the situation in the land of waves from both a practical and personal standpoint. She had so far only been in the small house Tsunami and Inari inhabited with Tizuna and the still missing Kaiza, and had no idea what the rest of waves looked like under Gato. She knew that Naruto had spoken something about attacking the bandits running amok through the lands, but couldn't even begin to fathom how bad it was. All she knew about the situation was a vague amount of information on Gato. He was a man that had become a shipping tycoon, with his products moved all over the elemental nations through his massive fleet of trade ships. The five great shinobi nations were regularly under his employ, as the number of shinobi he had escorted his caravans and fleets were nothing to laugh at. He was spoken of in only a positive light in the academy books she had read about him. It summarized him up as a rich man who provided ample missions to any village he was in a partnership with. If a caravan were moving through Hai no Kuni then shinobi from Konoha would guard it. If a caravan was moving through Kaze no Kuni, Sunagakir would be hired to protect it. Even if a caravan was moving through the mysterious Tetsu no Kuni, he would hire samurai instead of relying on the ronin one could pay for much cheaper. It was simply not a thing to call Gato a cruel man within any of the villages. From what she had seen of Nami no Kuni from the state of the home and Tazuna's talks, the man was a monster. He employed an army of bandits to terrorize and bully Nami no Kuni into submission. Any attempt by the people to remove his stranglehold on the land of waves was met with lethal force, if not torture beforehand. People were maimed, starved to death, thrown into rivers weighed down by rocks, their homes were burned with entire families still inside, and much worse. Gato himself roamed the streets from time to time with a group of ronin that would kill at their pleasure, raise towns, and destroy anything of value. People were randomly taken from villages, sometimes entire villages in truth, as slaves and sold. They were shipped from place to place, like the cargo of Gato's shipping empire moved from place to place. If people resisted, Gato would have them tortured. If they continued to resist, he would kill them. He was a monster who delighted in seeing the suffering he inflicted on the people without end and without hope of stopping him. He never stopped and would never stop his cruelty as long as he lived and as long as he still had power. How he could hide such cruelty from Shinobi confused her to no end. The academy never told her things like that. Gato was mentioned positively in the mission reports they were assigned to read. He paid well and was seen as a valued man of integrity and standards. How then could he be so evil to do the things he'd done to Nami no Kuni? Those men that are outside, why do they all look alike? Tsunami at last broke the silence between them. Her question was met with a short laugh from Sakura. She could explain what was really happening to the confused woman. Those are just clones Naruto made. He's one of my team members. Sakura waved her hand towards the door where several clones stood nearby inside. He learned a kenjutsu, a forbidden technique, called the Tajukage Bunshin no Jutsu. The multiple shadow clone technique is a simpler way of saying it. Tsunami seemed intrigued so Sakura continued even if she wasn't a fan of explaining how Naruto had come across the army that wouldn't leave her alone. The blue eyes across from them followed her every movement like always. There's a normal version called just the shadow clone technique that lets someone create several clones and an even simpler technique that's called the Bunshin no Jutsu or clone technique which just creates illusions to confuse an opponent. The Kinjutsu Naruto learned lets him creates hundreds or thousands of clones that would normally kill other people. 
He's not dead because he has a ridiculous amount of chakra, some people even think he has more than some of the legendary shinobi studied at the academy at their prime. She paused. Her eyes fell to the sword she had resting on the ground in front of her. After seeing some of the things he's pulled off recently, I agree with them. And he's only a student to your teacher? Tsunami's voice carried with it a combination of both shock and fear. It was easy to find the cause of both as describing Naruto's feats and learning that he was only a genin would surprise anyone. How strong is that man outside? He's the legendary Kakashi of the Sharingan so he's above any of us three. Even someone like Sasuke Kuen. Unseen to Sakura, the expressions of the clones nearby darkened. Their hatred of the legate grew as they heard the adoration in the voice of Sakura-chan. Only Preter deserved such a thing from the lovely Sakura-chan. Naruto doesn't even come close. Really? Tsunami stared at her wide-eyed before looking at the nearby clones before her body shook. Shinobi really are terrifying. Not many of us are like that. Sakura would do her best to calm the woman in front of her. A client needed to be kept at ease above everything else. Most aren't that bad or as strong as Kakashi-sensei and Naruto isn't as strong as you think. Creating so many shadow clones makes it that he doesn't have a lot of chakra left. He's lucky he had enough to make the trip here. Ignorance does not look well on you Sakura-chan. One of the centurions she had come to realize had been assigned to watch her walked over to the two then. His blue eyes held a glimmer in them that she didn't want to recognize. Preter stands above all with his tremendous strength. The legate bowed to him in the end, did he not? His words didn't bring anything but annoyance from Sakura. As if. Sakura turned to Tsunami. She knew she had to continue now if she had gotten under his skin so easily. Don't believe what they say by the way, Sasuke Kuen is way stronger than Naruto any day of the week. Humph, as I said before Sakura-chan, ignorance does not look well on you. The centurion crossed his arms over his chest and his blue eyes turned to Tsunami. Forgive Sakura-chan's words, she is still tired after such a long journey to this land and her mind is as exhausted as her body. She speaks falsities without knowing it. TCH, just get out of here already. Sakura pointed towards the door. I didn't ask for you to come over here you know. If you wish for me to leave Sakura-chan, I shall. He offered her a brief salute before he turned on his heel and marched away. His anger was still palpable and Tsunami did not speak for several minutes after he had marched to his post at the door and exited the house. A new centurion entered a few minutes later and stood guard at the door. They don't like this Sasuke boy much, do they? Tsunami finally spoke and Sakura nodded. Naruto's always been jealous of how strong sasuke kuen has been so his clones are the same. Sakura's eyes stayed focused on the wall in front of the two women. He named Sasuke the legate of this whole Orange Legion nonsense because he knows he'll probably fail at it all if he led them. Are you sure about that girly? Tazuna was surprisingly not drunk as he came down the stairs. He was completely sober and looked to have freshly shaven. What are you talking about Tazuna-san? Sakura's emerald eyes searched for the normal redness in Tazuna's eyes that marked a hangover but found none. The old man didn't bother with answering her as he went up to Tsunami and sat down next to her. I'll be leaving to work on the bridge soon. I'm heading off to make sure Kaiza's work hasn't all been ruined in the time I've been gone and he's been captured. Tazuna ran a hand over his freshly shaved face as he looked at Tsunami before clapping her on the shoulder. Don't worry much about me if I don't come back. I'll be staying with a few of the workers overnight to make sure no one else comes and tries to wreck it. We'll scare the young punks off. He chuckled. If they don't get the message and still try it, I'll give them a whooping and send them crying home to their mothers. He rose before anything could be said in opposition and walked towards a pack leaned against the wall. His tools were inside it and he briefly opened it and checked it. His eyes moved from tool to tool and he snapped it close. He reached for it before suddenly snapping his fingers. I almost forgot about the tools I've got at the bridge. He rose to his feet laughing again. I'll leave these here for when that Naruto kid comes back with Kaiza. He looked back at Tsunami. Tell him to stay and get some rest while this old man shows everyone how to really build the world's greatest bridge. I I will. Tsunami dabbed at her eyes. I hope you stay safe. I'll be fine. Tazuna moved to the door before pausing. He didn't turn around when he spoke. When that kid shows back up, the blonde one the girl's been talking about for the past few minutes, 
Tell him he's welcome to get a couple things from my room. They ain't much for what he's doing but I'm pretty sure he'll like what I've got up there. Please tell me it's not any of those magazines. Tsunami continued to dab at her eyes. You know how much I hate it when you show off your collection to all your perverted friends. He wishes he could get such a great collection. Tazuna laughed again, one hand extending out to the wall to support him as he nearly doubled over. Those are for Inari when he starts growing up to be a real man. He'll be the envy of all his friends with those treasures. Why you are? Tsunami suddenly rose. I've got to go check on Inari. She hurried out the room and Sakura watched her go in confusion. She was crying. Why? Remember to tell that Naruto kid about my room Sakura. Tazuna slowly rose back up. Sakura offered a noise of assent as she rose from her seat and went to go after Tsunami. Leave my daughter to a bit of time with her boy. She'll be back after I'm gone. You must be really perverted to make her cry like that. Sakura looked on with disapproval at the old man about to leave. If you weren't my team's client I would be showing you why you shouldn't say things like that to someone like Tsunami-san. She brought one armored fist up and the man only laughed as he turned back to the door. You really crack me up sometimes girl. Tazuna walked to the door and rose a hand up in farewell. Don't bother waiting for me. I've got a job to do and won't be back until it's finished. Whatever. Sakura rolled her eyes as she returned to her seat. Tazuna-san. The centurion at the door did not let him pass once he stepped up to it. He removed his helmet and placed it under his arm as he extended his hand. He offered the man in front of him an odd grin that would look more on place on a man with several decades more experience than the clone's young face showed. Allow me to escort you to our perimeter. If you want to, I'm not letting you slow me down. Tazuna offered the clone a grin as he laid a hand on his armored shoulder instead of accepting the offered hand. The centurion only nodded before turning towards the door and, after sparing one last look towards Sakura-chan, left after him. The door was sealed shut behind him by the Blossom Guards that resided outside near it. The two met a path already created by the Blossom Guards that stood outside the home. They had assembled into two forces, one on either side of the path and each saluted the Centurion and Tizuna as they passed with their swords meeting their broad shields. The clang of metal meeting metal was loud enough to dim their words to all but each other. You are not a wise man. A young punk like you can say that all you want. Words like that don't bother me much. You are surprisingly brave as well. Now that I can appreciate. The bridge builder chuckled. Among the Legion, there is a fact we all know to be true. The specter known as death marches with us at all times. Side by side we go forth together into the unknown. You kids are weird then. Do you really all have to be so morbid? What would you have us believe then? It's obvious kid. They neared the border of the gathered blossom guards. Hope. Hope? Yeah. That bridge I'm building is the perfect example. Do you think I'm building it because I worship death, that I want to die or something crazy like that? No. I'm building it because I've got hope and I'm banking it on that bridge. Call it an investment even. Everyone who's helped me build that bridge has got hope for our bit of the world being a better place once we finish it. We've all got hope that the world changes into something better than now when we finish that bridge. We all believe that the world becomes a better place with every new board we put down. We all believe the world gets better with every inch we move forward. Every nail, every piece of that bridge is another bit of progress towards the future we all want to see, the place we want our families to have when we're gone. And what has that hope you've held accomplished? You're a real little smartass, know that kid. Tazuna chuckled good-naturedly at the centurion's comment. As for what's hope gotten me? For one, it's gotten that bridge out of my old head. Two, instead of dying with me I've gotten that bridge and everything it stands for out to the people I'm building it for. Everybody in Waves is banking on that bridge to bring a better tomorrow and I'm going to get as much of it done today as I can before, well before I get tired. He chuckled. It was too loud for either of them and tapered off rather quickly. Where are the arms of hope then? Where are the workers of hope? Where is hope if you rely on it so much? Or is it nothing but a delusion you hold on to? What is hope capable of sending to assist you beyond your fantasy already born of it? Bah! As if I need more workers when I've got these two arms right here. The old man rose his arms and flexed, the centurion having to admit that he had an impressive physique for a man his age. 
I've laid down half the damn frame myself and I'll keep doing it until I've got it all done. And once it is, Gato will see what Hope can do when that bridge breaks his stranglehold on Nami no Kuni. You are a strange man Tazuna. They neared the edge of the formation. Both came to a stop as the centurion turned to look at the man that would walk without him down a lonesome road. The forest around them may have been cleared but it still shadowed the path ahead. The centurion turned back to the path and pressed a finger to his ear. Century, on me. Who? Distantly he heard the call that answered him as he removed his finger and turned to Tazuna once again. The Uzumaki Empire's Orange Legion does not march on hope. His statement was a simple fact. We march to battle, to glory, and to death. No mocking was seen in the eyes of either as they met across the distance, neither refused the views of the other. They could disagree and they, as was silently decided, would use the bridge to find the answer. Every step draws us closer to those three so intrinsically linked and draws us deeper into the unknown. We march to battle not for ourselves but for the Uzumaki Empire. We march not for our own glory but for the glory of Praetor. We march not for the death of Praetor but for our own. Blue eyes carrying an age that seemed both natural and unnatural locked with those of Tazuna. Today, I shall march my men with you and not with hope. If you march with me, you've got to be marching with hope. Tazuna looked out at the path before him. I'm walking with the same hope that everyone in Nami no Kuni's got in their souls. Not a single one of us want Gato to keep his grip on our land forever. Then you are in luck. The centurion settled his helmet over his head as he heard the steps of his soldiers approaching. My century will march to see the glory of Gato's hold destroyed over the lands of the Uzumaki Empire. The Orange Legion has already marched with death with bandit filth already been exterminated and now we shall finish the task set before us with his head. I like you kid. Tazuna settled his hat on his head. Your boss isn't too bad either. I shall have you speak those words to Praetor himself then Tazuna. We'll see about that. As one, they took the first steps into the unknown, with the century following behind them. It'll be any time now. Kakashi spoke to himself more than anyone else. He continued his watch from the trees where he crouched within and awaited the moment the mission became a mission. He'll be here any time now. Praetor is advancing. The voice came from next to him, a centurion that had positioned himself in the trees with Kakashi. The clone pulled a hand away from his ear and blue eyes locked with the sole visible one of the shinobi. He is bringing Kaiza with him. Of course he is. Despite himself, the jonin couldn't help but grin beneath his mask. I never doubted him for a second. None should doubt the glory of Praetor. The centurion spoke no more to Kakashi, the jonin more than fine to merely sit in silence among the leaves and branches around him as he awaited the inevitable. Praetor. Who? As one, the assembled Blossom Guards rose from their formations and turned to face the Praetorians escorting the one who would see the Uzumaki Empire flourish across the lands. The man with him, one most of the Legion now knew to be Kaiza, looked on in shock at the vast numbers arrayed around the widened clearing to his house. His thoughts were going mad as he tried to piece together the strength of the boy in front of him, younger than him by a significant margin yet powerful beyond his wildest imagination. If you're not a Jonin yet, what can your teacher do? The man could only ask such a question to try and understand exactly what kind of monster shinobi truly were. Sure, he had heard all the stories of the ones like Madara Achiha and Hashirama Senju making a valley, but he always thought that was something people blew out of proportion. He heard about a guy named the Yellow Flash who made his name from war and being fast enough to wipe out entire armies, but he again thought it was just a fluke. He even heard about how a kid killed an entire clan of ninja just because he wanted to, but all those things had to be fake, they all had to be exaggerations about what shinobi could really do. No one could make valleys, no one could take on armies by himself, and a child couldn't kill hundreds of people in a single night. He had thought he understood how things worked. Now? Now his opinion was vastly different. If one kid, one of the lowest rank at just a genin, could create an entire army then what could a jonin do? What could the kage do? What could all those s-rank missing nin do to get such massive bounties on their heads? How many monsters lived in the world that he still didn't know about? These thoughts and more swirled in his mind but Naruto began talking and disrupted them. 
Silver Fong may face a portion of my forces before he is inevitably destroyed but my clash with him was a thing of great tragedy and greater glory. Naruto's blue eyes shine with pride, the stunned awe of Kaiza a thing of beauty to him. It was all merely a sign for how truly incredible his great orange legion was and the grand Uzumaki empire the men within it served. His awe spoke of what he would find when he looked in the eyes of those who doubted his dream, who doubted his men's true strength, those who believed he was nothing but talk and boasts would learn the error of their ways when he unleashed his forces like they were presented now. This is hardly my full muster either. I've spread the portion of men I brought with me across your lands with my legate. I'll be speaking with him soon and order a detachment to march back with us to show you how powerless a man like Gato has become in lands ruled by the Uzumaki Empire and protected by its Orange Legion. Shinobi are terrifying. Kaiza could only offer a rueful smile and shake of his head as he stepped forward and looked towards the small home surrounded by ring after ring of men identical to the blonde he had been talking with for so long. Mind if I go and see my family Preter? You have not yet fully assumed your role as my vicarious of Nami no Kuni. There is no need to be so formal Kaiza. Naruto stepped forward, his Praetorians opening up the formation around him fully and letting him pass through them without issue. A clone marched forward from the house and stopped in front of Naruto and offered him what Kaiza recognized as the standard greeting of Naruto's troops, a fist over his heart. You may do whatever you wish. One of my centurions I have stationed here will be the one to answer any questions you may have while I deal with something else. Going out again already? Kaiza seemed anxious to approach his home but curiosity got the better of him. What are you planning to do now, go off and rule the world? Hmm, that is the plan. Naruto offered a grin before he vanished from sight. Well, I can get behind that. Kaiza's smile didn't leave his face as he turned and walked towards the clones that Naruto had guard his home. Now, it's time to face my wife. Kaiza was not afraid of Gato and his thugs but his sweet tsunami terrified him to no end. She would be glad to have him back but he had a feeling she was more than angry at him. She was most likely pissed at everything he had done from continuing to work on the bridge to refusing to even listen to Tazuna's offer to stay behind and let him go to Konoha for the shinobi. She is going to be so angry with me. The soldiers moved aside as one unit, sealing the formation behind him as he walked past them and Naruto's Praetorians remained at the front while someone began barking out orders about a camp. He eventually stepped too far away to hear what they were saying, but he had gotten the gist of it all. They would be setting up a camp for Naruto to return to with his legate and whatever troops he brought back with him. He actually found himself curious as to what numbers Naruto would be bringing back. You are nervous. A centurion had stepped out of the house to greet him, ten men spreading out around him and Kaiza and forming a half circle with their shields and swords held at the ready. That is good. The centurion turned and knocked on the door. The Uzumaki Empire shall be made great here if you keep such a thing close to your heart. What? Kaiza could ask no more as the door was opened and he saw, for the first time in too long of a time, his wife and the boy that was his son no matter his blood. Tsunami. Inari. Kaiza. Dad. His smile was wide as he caught hold of the running Inari and lifted him into the air, holding the small boy and both had equal grins on their faces. Tsunami only smiled as she walked up to him. He set Inari down after holding him up for a moment longer and that was when she kissed him. I'm glad you're back, Kaiza. She smiled at him. Then she slapped him, her face suddenly grim. Never do something so stupid again. I promise I won't. Kaiza didn't take offense to the strike. He had it coming after what he had put them all through. He smiled at her and wrapped his arms around her simply to hold her. Where's the old man? Silence greeted him from Tsunami. It didn't even take him a moment to know what she was going to say. Her silence, the way she seemed to use him to support herself, everything screamed the truth he didn't want to hear. It screamed of only a terrible future that he thought he could somehow stop. He thought he could prevent any more tragedy and despair from plaguing the small family he had found in Nami no Kuni. He was wrong. He headed off to start working on the bridge. Damn that old drunk. He wanted to go but he couldn't. The thought of not going filled him with rage but the idea to just stay here, to stay here while Tazuna willingly went to his death was enough to make him want to vomit with his disgust. I can't let him do this. He wanted to pull away but Tsunami held him back. Kaiza, he wanted to go alone. 
She did not let him go. He couldn't let her go either. Holding her let him remember why he had to stay. Holding her, seeing Inari so happy, both made him want to stay because he had to just like Tazuna had to go. He had to stay for them just like he had to leave for them. Tazuna wanted them happy. He wanted Nami no Kuni free nearly as much. Damn you old man. You know? I can go get him if you want. Sakura had silently appeared behind the three reunited family members. She had heard everything. She wanted to hit herself for everything she had said to the man before he left. She felt like such a fool. No, she felt worse than any fool. She had insulted him when he had walked off to die. He cared for the people who lived in Nami no Kuni enough to not even consider running anymore. He knew he would die the moment he went to the bridge and didn't bother with thinking up a way to escape death. He wanted to put his faith in Kaiza, he put his faith in all the people of Nami no Kuni to finish building the bridge. Really? It wasn't Kaiza who spoke, it was Inari. He was suddenly in front of her, ignoring the way the hands of the two centurions with her fell to their weapons as he grabbed hold of her at the waist. You can bring back grandpa? Of course I can. Sakura knelt down and offered him a smile. Naruto gave me my blossom guards to fight, and Akunoichi from Konoha never fails her mission. She held out her hand to the small child. What do you say Inari, want to give me my mission? Yeah. He took her offered hand and Sakura grinned at him. All right then. She smiled even if she wanted to do anything but this but she knew she didn't have a choice after what she had said. She never wanted any of this to happen when all she had wanted was some privacy for once from the clones that constantly hounded her. I wish I didn't have to act like such a bitch with those clones around. Legate Sasuke. Naruto stood before the Uchiha. His Praetorian stood at his back, the Centurion in charge of them at the head and Sasuke's own century was assembled behind him. The difference was that their weapons were at their sides and each of them had fallen to a single knee before Praetor. The Uchiha remained standing with his arms clasped behind him. His weapons were the first things taken upon Naruto's arrival to camp. His helmet rested at his feet. The rest of the centurions stood on either side with their century standing at attention behind them. You have brought glory to the Orange Legion by disobeying my orders. I did. Sasuke's red and black eyes did not leave the twin blue abyss that Naruto's own had become as he stared at the Uchiha. I await judgment from you, Praetor. One hand came from his back to his chest and he saluted Naruto. I should strip you of your rank. I should even kill you for marching into the unknown as you did. Naruto's words brought forth no response from the Uchiha. He could only wait for the inevitable judgment that the blonde would pass on him. I should have you executed publicly for such a thing. His hand rested on the hilt of the sword at his side. I could demand you fight before the legion you sought to disgrace with defeat, without arms, and without sight. A blind fool stumbling through darkness would fit you perfectly legged. At his words, the centurions of the centuries around him stepped forward. Their hands fell to the weapons at their backs and each looked to Praetor. You know the dagger all centurions carry, correct legged Sasuke? Naruto was not met with words. Answer me now. Yes Praetor. Sasuke's eyes did not leave Naruto's own. It is not given a name because it has not yet drawn the blood of all those foolish enough to stand in your path to glory and make enemy of your glorious legion. Yes. Naruto stepped forward and the centurion at the head of his praetorians followed each of his steps. Every centurion carries this unnamed dagger so that they may bring glory even in death. It has not yet drawn blood of any kind so I have not given it a name. There is a ghost of one through. Naruto's hand left his blade and settled at the hilt of the weapon at his back. Some of my more unruly centurions have seen fit to call it a name I see some value in now. Senjusatsu. Thousand Armed Murder. A silver of the blade was exposed to the world in that moment. It promised death if it was to be fully drawn. Its thirst for blood would be fulfilled before it was placed away again. Nothing could stop it. Nothing would stop it. Blood would fall. Flesh would be cut. Death would come from the blade parched of it, and its thirst would at last be quenched. His hand fell away as swiftly as it gripped the handle. It will go unnamed for today. Naruto abruptly turned, and the orange cloak at his back flared out behind him. Your command will remain legate, Sasuke. Your full power will be reinstated at a later date but until then you shall command none I do not directly assign under your command. For now, until this campaign is over with, the men in this camp are yours to command. 
Your power shall remain limited. The men do not leave the camp unless I order it. You may assign drills to run alone unless we fall under attack. You shall provide counsel while I plan the counterattack. The enemy will be crushed and pursued by my legion if it deemed necessary. If such predictions come to pass, the centurions of the third cohort of my legion will take orders from either myself or my Praetorian centurion. The centurion stepped forward. He is named Prefectus Castrorum of this camp. If you disobey him, he may kill you if he so wishes. Am I understood? Of course Praetor. Sasuke fell to a knee and hate shine within the Sharingan his eyes remained locked in. Good. Begin training spars at your leisure within the next 30 minutes. Naruto departed to his tent without another word. The newly named Prefectus Castrorum did not spare the Uchiha a single glance as his focus turned instead to the organization of the camp he now resided over. Sasuke remained where he had been when Naruto dismissed him, unmoving as rage consumed his entire being. Uzumaki. His teeth were tightly clenched and his hands balled into fists at his side. He wanted to do nothing more than to reject this punishment but did not have the power to do so against Naruto and the vast force before him, a force he had once controlled with great authority. He was too weak to fight such numbers alone. He remained too weak to do anything to prevent his punishment. Uzumaki. He still didn't have enough hate. He didn't have enough power. Uzumaki. Clear your eyes legged as they seem to be clouded by insanity. His centurion stepped up to him his arms crossed over his armored chest with his sword at his side. The third will not stand to see you die of such a vile thing but neither will any of us stand such disrespect towards Praetor and his glorious dream. TCH. The response hardly counted as such as the Uchiha rose from where he had knelt and collected his helmet from where I rested on the ground. It laid underneath his arm as he turned to the centurion and hateful red and black locked with the same blue eyes that had sentenced him to his current fate. Order the legion to begin training by century. The first and tenth of the third will start. Second and ninth will follow an hour later. Third and eighth, fourth and seventh, and fifth and sixth will follow in that order for every additional hour that passes. When they finish, send them to rest, once the next group arrives send those waiting dash, he stopped himself. He no longer held the authority to say such a thing. I believe the centurions of the third will wish to see you before you depart from Nami no Kuni, Legate. The centurion spoke no more. He had left and with him the century that was supposedly Sasuke's own rose to their feet and filed away after his flowing orange cape. Bastard. It was a more vocal response to what he was feeling than before. He retrieved his weapons, his sword hanging from his side and his shield strapped to his arm, and moved towards the edge of the camp. He would take a watch and clear his head of the hate he felt at the moment. You should know to watch yourself leg it. Two of Naruto's Praetorians stood in his path and he felt more than saw two others approach him from behind. Their helmets were off, sitting on a table nearby and not one of the clones let their hands fall away from the hilt of their swords. We have sworn to protect Praetor with our lives and we are always watching. The Sharingan sees more than your eyes ever will. His retort was simple, a statement born of both pride and facts. He had known the position of the hidden Praetorians now behind him long before they had sprung from it and manufactured this confrontation. Do you want to see what else it can do? You wish to spar? The Praetorian looked surprised even if only for a moment. The clone quickly brought his expression back under control and offered a grin to the Uchiha. You wish to battle me? I wish to battle the four of you. Sasuke's grin matched those of the four Praetorians. As legate, it is my duty to ensure the Orange Legion standards are met. The Praetorians of course must be held to an even greater standard than all others for they stand with Praetor in battle. You would not like the outcome. Yes. You would probably sob with a splinter from the training swords. The narrowing of blue eyes did not change the taunting light in his eyes. True steel is the only option if you hold such a fear. We accept. For voices spoke as one and they went to retrieve their helmets and shields and Sasuke's grin became far less mocking and more honest, at least at the moment. He had gotten something out of this, he had lost much of his power over the legion while the third remained in Nami no Kuni but the battle he now faced was worth it. The four Praetorians were no doubt highly skilled, well coordinated, and motivated to leave him defeated at their feet. It was the best test to see how far he had come since his last spar with Naruto. Word spread swiftly in the Orange Legion's third cohort. 
A crowd had gathered around the ring set aside for sparring of such a small degree and the four Praetorians entered behind the legate of the Orange Legion. He rolled his shoulders as he turned once reaching the center. The four spread out into a line and with a bang their shields were raised and swords drawn from their sides with the Song of Steel. Sasuke did not follow their examples at the moment. He settled his helmet over his head before drawing his sword with a shout. He rose his shield up and let the flat of his blade strike the solid metal that was his greatest defense. The Praetorians responded in time as they began a slow march forward. It was in unison, one foot moved forward for one and the other three followed. The width of their steps differed through, two in the center lagged behind the two on the outer edges of their formation. Sasuke stepped back as they approached, his Sharingan dancing from one to the next with no rhyme or reason to it. His gaze shifted abruptly from one side, to the center, to the other side. Right, center, left. Left, center right. Right, Che charged forward with a shout, his shield used like a ram to strike at the center right and the two shields clashed. He didn't remain for long. His sword lashed out, parrying the blow of the second Praetorians in the center and his eyes followed the left Praetorian as he moved to flank him. He shoved forward again before quickly disengaging and moved his shield to the right. A sword did not draw blood or scratch his armor as it was blocked by his shield before his blade once again lunged forward and clashed with the blade of the leftmost Praetorian as he surged forward. His own shield was used to break the clash of blades and Sasuke spun away, his shield coming close to his body as he brought his arm against it as he did so. He created distance for only a moment before he banged his sword on his shield and readied himself for a charge. Two Praetorians, those on the left, answered his challenge for battle and their blade swung at him with intent to kill. His shield blocked the blows of both and both lunged forward with their own shields to no doubt throw him to the ground. Sasuke did not let them get the chance. He freed his arm of the shield but did not relinquish his hold entirely. He used the strap to drive the shield into the ground before he rolled to the side and around it. Their shields dislodged a spray of dirt when they upturned his own that neither allowed to impair them before the legate was upon them. His sword clashed with one, his shield raised in defense before he swung out and turned it to the side. The blow missed as Sasuke leaned back to avoid it. He was nearly thrown onto his back when the shield filled his vision as it was thrown forward by the Praetorian. He darted around to the Praetorian's side and his sandal struck out at his exposed side and knocked him aside and into his fellow clone. The soldier of the Orange Legion was batted to the side and to the ground by the shield of the other and the legate was once again engaged. A shield met his blade and he did not stay in place long enough to be struck by the two Praetorians that approached him from behind. Their blade slashed only air as he backed up and held his sword out in front of him, the sharp point all the challenge his foes needed. The fallen Praetorian had risen to his feet at this point, holding his side as he glared at the legate and joined the other three. Once again for stood against him and Sasuke's hands loosened and tightened their grip on the hilt of his weapon. He swallowed and darted forward. A solid wall met his charge but he did not expect to break through it for even a moment. His foot impacted the center of one of the shields and his second followed above it. He ran up the shields of the Praetorians in a suicidal maneuver. Four shields were moved away as the Praetorians folded their line into a tight box and four blades shot upwards to impale him upon his descent when he vanished. His discarded shield took his place and the Praetorians broke their formation to avoid falling prey to any trap he had set with it. The legate did not follow up with a counterattack from where he now rested on a single knee on the ground, his sword impaled next to him. He only took a moment to breathe. In and out. Tiger. Ram. Monkey. He brought one closed hand up to his mouth, two fingers raised. Katan, Gokaku no Jutsu. Flames spewed forth from his open lips, a fireball surging through the air and aiming to incinerate the Praetorians that stood against him. Shields. For shields were rammed into the ground before all four fled back from them. Only their swords were now in their hands. The fireballs crashed against the shields and washed over them. Flames licked at the ground, at the steel, it hungered to consume but could not. Sasuke did not bother with waiting for it to dissipate before he once again made use of his shield, he took its place and his sword rushed to meet those of his four foes with a grin. That is enough legate Sasuke. Silently Preter had approached the training grounds and amusement shined in his eyes as he took in the scene before him. 
the five combatants and the soldiers of his legion observing the bout between his legate and Praetorians had frozen and given him their undivided attention. All had fallen to a single knee, heads bowed in his presence, and saluted him in the customary manner of his orange legion with a clenched fist over their armored heart. My Praetorians will return to their duties as you will yours. As you wish, Praetor. All five spoke together, bowing their heads as their armored hearts were covered by a closed fist. The legate's grin did not leave his face. Sakurachan, I insist you return to the house. The centurion continued speaking even if she ignored him. He followed her regardless of what he wanted her to do and the blossom guards followed after the two with some nervousness. They did not care about themselves but Sakurachan marched into what could be only death for the best of the Orange Legion, perhaps even Praetor himself. None feared their own deaths but the idea of Sakurachan joining them was enough to bring fear to their hearts. Such failure would not even allow death as an avenue of escape from Praetor's wrath. Centurion Uzumaki and his men remained silent. A centurion near the two spoke up as he removed a finger from his ear. We will not have anything the scouts do not provide for us. Curses. The centurion once again turned to Sakura. I do not do this lightly. He drew his sword and placed himself in the way of the marching Sakura. Return to the H- -dash, Sakura's emerald eyes glared at him and he was silenced. He felt incredibly, insignificantly small when looked upon by those eyes. He felt as if he was truly less than nothing. He felt as if he was a waste to even exist, a plague to the dream of Praetor. As he looked into the twin pools of furious emerald he felt worthless before such might. His sword fell to his side, his arm limp and his grip only maintained through instinct born of the intense training he had gone through for his rank. If not for his body's natural inclination to hold the blade he would not be able to do so. Get out of my way. She spoke only five words and he listened. His sword was wordlessly returned to his side as he stepped aside. As Sakura passed him he pressed a numb finger to his ear. Praetor. I know already Centurion. Naruto's grin was audible as he chuckled. Sakura-chan is marching to the drunk's aid I imagine? Yes Praetor. I was unable to stop her. The Centurion remembered the abyss he had foolishly stared into and trembled. She marches with her blossom guards. Good. I shall assault from the opposite side with the majority of the third cohort. If Sabuza Momoichi truly is there then I shall have his head before this day is over with. Your glorious leadership will see such a thing become reality Praetor. Of course it shall, of course it shall. Regardless, I am issuing an order as of this moment Centurion Uzumaki. As always, you are not to allow Sakurachan to come to harm. She is to be protected above all others on the battlefield. In addition, the third on the other side of the bridge shall be alone. Keep your forces on the opposite side. We shall crush Momoichi and obtain great glory this day. I shall eagerly do so Praetor. I'm not going to let someone die when I can stop it. It was the thought that made Sakura move. It was that thought that allowed her not to tremble. It was the fact that she had been so self-absorbed to not see what was right in front of her that motivated her to take each new step. She would make sure she didn't fail the mission Inari gave her. She would be sure to bring his grandfather home to him no matter what. Far away from the Centurion and Sakura, a mist slowly drew across the water. Soon it would engulf the bridge that an old man worked on and a dark chuckle abounded within it. Soon, so very soon, the demon would be unleashed. Soon death would come. Man, can you believe what that Uzumaki kid's done still? Two Chunin leaned outside the guard post that they seemed to eternally man day in and day out. That clone army of his is kind of freaky to see everywhere even when he's gone. How much Churka does he have if he can even walk after that? I don't know, I'm just glad the kid's on our side. Those are Kage level reserves at minimum. Yeah. I still think the fourth could beat him if he really wanted to. What's one army to another, you know? He just wiped out that IWA battalion right? How are you so sure he can take out that kid's whole army? He wiped it out by himself so I'm pretty sure he can handle some untrained kid and his clones too. Whatever you say Izumo. Izumo Kamazuki and Kotetsu again returned silently to their duties a moment or so later after the conversation between the two shinobi had ended. Both sent a quick glance to the still as statue hundred clones of Naruto Uzumaki that had been standing at the gate since they had begun their guard shift a few hours ago. It was unnerving just how still the hundred clones had been. 
curious kids had raced up to them, made faces, some had run between their ranks, and others had nearly begun to attack them before they were hastily pulled away. The blue eyes of the one they knew to be the clone in charge of the others, the Hokage's briefing referred to them as Centurions, was also enough to send them scurrying away. More of the clones labeled Centurions in the aforementioned briefing had approached every hour or so with a hundred times as many clones with them as they were them. Both were lucky it never surpassed two. Beyond the all but statues with them, the mission was as normal as always. Check in a few merchants, check out a few merchants, check any caravans heading inside, sign off on any shinobi leaving the village, and more of the usual. The clones never spoke or moved during it all. They were arrayed in four rows, two on each side of the street, and faced in towards the street. The centurion responsible for them remained standing just outside the gates with his eyes focused towards the path to the village. What are they W- Izumo was interrupted. Preter is returning. Present yourselves. Who? The clang of metal on metal resounded through the plaza just inside the village from the gates and the hundred clones moved at last. They assembled into ten rows, all but blockading the streets as the centurion in charge of them strode to the front of the formation. The clones, as one, shifted their helmets from under their arms to over their heads and adjusted their grip on their shields. Their free hands fell down to the blades at their sides and grabbed hold of the hilts. What's going on with those guys? Shikamaru paused in his walk, glancing behind him at the source of the noise and seeing the Kage Bunshin had at last moved from where they had been as still as statues. His curiosity was piqued no matter what happened now and he turned to his jonin sensei, one Asuma Sarutobi. Asuma sensei, do you mind letting us see what this is all about? We'll take a vote. Asuma took a drag from his near ever-present cigarette before speaking again. Everyone in favor of sticking around, raise your hands. He closed his eyes and preemptively rubbed his temple to try to beat back a future headache before opening them. Three hands were in the air. Ino had hearts in her eyes at the thought of seeing Sasuke Kuen in a uniform. Shikamaru wanted to see what else Naruto's clones would do after their last encounter. Choji was partially curious and partially just putting his hand up because Shikamaru did. Ino Shikacho really does stick together. He couldn't help but let out a good-natured sigh before he took another deep breath of his cigarette. It looks like I'm completely outvoted. He pointed down the street where a number of benches were placed near the gate. They actually gave a perfect view of the Orange Legion facing the gate. We can go watch from over there if you really want to. Alright, let's go then. Shikamaru earned a raised eyebrow as he led the way over before the Sarutobi merely shook his head in amusement. What motivates a Nara to lead the way? Too much curiosity. Gai-sensei, look. Nearby, Team Guy had been waiting just as long as the Orange Legion's troops. Mato Guy, the leader of the team, had heard of Kakashi's imminent return to the village and couldn't help but await his rival and his team's first real mission. Reports from ANBU were clear, Team 7 hadn't actually taken a real mission until now thanks to the clones doing all the D-ranks for them. Their first mission had been a C-rank assignment to Nami no Kuni. Guy believed it was an escort mission. I see. Strangely enough, since they had begun to observe the Orange Legion, Guy had been far from his usual self. He hadn't been loud once and had instead been observing the clones before him with an intelligence rarely displayed as it was now. A shinobi does not rise to the ranks of Jonin with pure skill. A shinobi does not contest with Kakashi Hitaki, a natural genius if there ever was one, through sheer strength. A man does not obtain the heights of the green beast of Konoha without a great mind bonded with skill. It looks like Team 7 is coming back. They must be the welcoming party. So Naruto's coming back? Ten Ten had picked up on the slack. Her voice overflowed with excitement and she seemed to nearly be jumping up and down from where the four-man cell waited on the rooftops. He's going to be back, right Guy sensei Indeed he is. Niji can confirm it, can you not my pupil? Three sets of eyes turned to the Hyuga to catch a glimpse of the deactivating Byakugan. He was silent for only a moment before offering a nod and received three very different responses. YOSH. Lee was excited as always but for a number of reasons. At last I may see my rival and Sakura-chan. I can't wait to ask him where he got such amazing weapons. Ten Ten was excited to see the man behind the weapons of the Orange Legion. I wonder how you fared, Kakashi. 
Guy was contemplative strangely enough. He had no ill will towards the Orange Legion, Naruto Uzumaki, Sakura Haruno, Sasuke Achiha, or the Jonin in charge of the three genin. He merely had many questions and wished for answers. One of them was of course how well his rival's first pass genin team measured up to his own and another was more difficult to answer. He had seen Kakashi after the bell test to pass Team 7 and unlike the others present, with even Lord Hokage included in such a grouping, had truly seen him for what he was in that moment with a glance. Kakashi was tired. He masked it well, no doubt from his days in ANBU Black Ops, but he was exhausted. The level of devastation he had unleashed was nothing to scoff at but it was far from the legendary Jonin's true capabilities. The Orange Legion had pushed Kakashi to his physical limits instead of the near-mythical heights of his chakra reserves. He had enough chakra left to battle the entire night if he had to but his body was running on near fumes. The Jonin had most likely collapsed after the meeting when he had vanished. He had slept the day away and been late to the first official meeting of Team 7 for a good reason. Guy was curious as to how Naruto had pushed his rival to such limits. How had a genin pushed a jonin to his near physical limits in the end? What had happened at training ground 7 while everyone else was nearly consumed by the panic Naruto's marching clones had brought forth? It was this and more that had created his contemplative manner as of late. His mind had been racked with reasoning that made sense but he knew he was missing something of vital importance. He could understand what had happened with it but without it he would forever remain in the dark. He needed to learn it from someone present. He needed to learn it from Kakashi. He shook his head to clear it. He had caught sight of the upright silver hair of his rival and leaped off the rooftop to meet him and find his answers. Kakashi. His exuberance had returned. He raced down the path to his rival and to the answers to his many questions. Elsewhere, hidden in the shadows, a dozen ANBU trusted by the Hokage watched from the trees as the marching column came into sight. The first thing they noticed was obvious. It was reduced to only a hundred of the clones that had been labeled Naruto's Praetorians, his bodyguards in short. None of the clones given to the Haruno girl, her blossom guard, were present anymore. Another thing was their positioning. Kakashi walked at a sedate pace behind the three genin with his arms behind his head, nothing abnormal about that, and the genin walked ahead of him in one row. The Uchiha was on the left, Sakura was in the middle, and Naruto was on the right. There was also the incredible amount of power pouring out of the Uzumaki seemingly every second. It was enough to give an inexperienced sensor a near migraine if they focused too much and already one of the newer ANBU had to shake his head. What is that? Asuma didn't let any of his shock show on his face as he spotted Team 7 stop just outside the gates and Naruto stepped forward. Kakashi was lazily talking with an energetic as always guy as the blonde stepped up to the centurion standing before the gate. Kneel before your preter. The centurion fell to a knee and the shadow clones arrayed in front of Naruto followed his example. Each planted their shield into the ground and dropped to a knee with their heads bowed and the hilt of their sword still clenched in their hands. Only the centurion covered his armored heart with his fist. We have awaited your return preter. I'm glad to see that my orange legion has not fallen in my absence. As Naruto spoke, Sasuke silently approached behind him and stood at his right side. The Uzumaki's Praetorians arrayed themselves in a formation identical to the other clones just flipped in what direction they faced. Now, where is the Prefectus Castrorum I gifted with command of my glorious legion? He eagerly awaits your return in the main camp Praetor. The Centurion had not raised his head once he had bowed it. Naruto looked over at the curious villagers and more obvious shinobi present before he turned to the Uchiha behind him. Once our meeting with the Hokage is done, I expect you to spread the word of what has happened to the rest of my legion. His words were whispered but they did not need to be concealed. The information was not that difficult to acquire and both knew it as such. Your will shall be done Praetor. Sasuke offered the salute of the Orange Legion of the Uzumaki Empire to Praetor's words and the blonde offered him a nod in return. His eyes returned to the soldiers of his legion arrayed behind him and he was silent for several seconds before speaking. Centurion Uzumaki of the First Cohort's 5th Century. At the sound of Praetor directly addressing him, the Centurion shot to his feet and his hand remained where it had been for quite some time now, clenched into a fist above his armored heart. You and First Cohort's 5th Century are dismissed from your post. Who? 
A great smoke cloud drifted into the air a moment later as the entire century, centurion included, vanished to parts unknown to most of the denizens of Kanoha. Naruto seemed to ignore it as he stepped through the smoke and Sasuke followed after him. With a shout, a dozen of his Praetorians raced forward and encircled the two high-ranking leaders of the Orange Legion, the Legate and Praetor. Sakura briefly conversed with the centurion of Naruto's Praetorians and turned to Kakashi. Kakashi-sensei, do you mind if I go with you? The pink-haired genin looked to the silver-haired jonin and guy couldn't help but notice the rage suddenly shining in numerous pairs of blue eyes. Both the obvious and hidden soldiers of Naruto's Orange Legion had only moments ago looked upon Sakura with adoration but had swiftly shifted to hated towards his rival. Yet another question with no answer. Guy wanted to sigh before he drew his rival's attention was a clap on the shoulder and a smile some would describe as blindingly bright. We can continue our conversation later my eternal rival. For now, do not allow me to interfere with a student so eager to spend time with you. I will leave you alone to impart your knowledge onto her. I shall do the same with my pupils and we will see which one of us proves more sagely. Guy was back to being as boisterous as always it seemed. Silently Kakashi met his eyes with his sole visible one and a message was exchanged. Later. Ah, this is precisely why I never bothered with kids before. Kakashi raised a hand in farewell as he stepped up to the genin. Sometimes they can be so demanding and I'm stuck dealing with whatever they want though sometimes. I just want to be sure you don't do anything before reporting back to the Hokage with the rest of us, Kakashi-sensei. Sakura smiled at him and the clones around them, having silently spread out into a barrier between the two and the populace of Kanoha, marched in time with their steps as they began walking. Naruto and Sasuke are probably already halfway there so do you really want to lose to your genin students? Kakashi was silent for a moment before the pink-haired genin was swept up in his arms to the shouted protest of the clones that encircled them. Swords had been drawn and the centurion left behind leveled the blade with the jonin. Unhand Sakurachan. His voice was a growl as something came upon his eyes that made Kakashi file it away for later. Later. The jonin vanished in a puff of smoke and the centurion truly did snarl as he sheathed his blade and turned to the near-feral Praetorians around him. All returned their blades to their sides as his eyes swept over them before he marched out to the perimeter. A pair of twin lines formed behind him as he pressed a finger to the side of his helmet. Preter, Legate, Silver Fong has taken Sakurachan ahead of her guard. I will deal with this. Preter was unconcerned from his tone but none could feel the anger he must have held greater than the soldiers of the Orange Legion. They all felt the same rage at the blatant disrespect Silver Fong showed Preter every moment he could. He was an enemy that would one day be eliminated with extreme prejudice. Return to camp and await myself and Legate Sasuke. We will arrive with all possible haste once this business at the Hokage Tower is finished. Your Orange Legion shall eagerly await your return Praetor. The centurion of Naruto's Praetorians removed his finger from his ear and the grip on the hilt of his sword tightened several times over. There will come a day when I will know low dash, finally. A girl with her hair in a pair of buns was suddenly in front of him and all but grabbed hold of the centurion. I've been waiting over a week to talk to you. You've got to tell me where Naruto found such classics like this. Somehow her hands now held his blade and it was gone from his side. The centurion took a moment or two to process such a thing. Where were they stowed away at? Are they all custom made? Did he make the entire set himself? He's a good smith, but there are some flaws that I saw and I've got loads of tips for him. How does he have so many copies? Is it some special jutsu he created? Is he using seals? If he really did something that incredible then you have to let me see him and ask him everything about the process. His hand robotically reached out and took hold of his weapon as the Praetorians with him were silently sent on ahead with a wave of his unoccupied hand. IJ dash, he raised the same hand to her mouth to silence her. Despite the interruption and suddenness of their meeting, he knew her well thanks to her familiarity to several of the Legion for similar encounters. A thought struck him suddenly and Praetorian Centurion Uzumaki of the Orange Legion of the Uzumaki Empire smiled. I believe Praetor is far more capable of answering any questions you have of his glorious Orange Legion. He stepped to her side and offered his arm to her, one she took after only a moment and the two stepped down the street with their arms interlocked. May I have your name if you don't mind? Ten Ten Ken at your service. 
I am Praetorian Centurion Uzumaki and I, when Praetor himself is not present, lead the Praetorians of his magnificent Orange Legion. The Praetorian's mind was moving rather quickly as he spoke. They had swiftly caught up with the slow marching Praetorians and they continued forward in formation, wordlessly separating to allow the Centurion to head to the front with his guest. Tell me, Kensan, what other words do you have on Praetor's Orange Legion? He did not question where the notebook came from. Reports he had checked before the return from Nami no Kuni showed she was well versed in Fuinjutsu. It was the entirety of her fighting style in many ways and something the Orange Legion Centurions had expressed interest in. The ability to transport so many weapons wasn't as important as her ingenuity and versatility. Observations showed her a master of most if not all of the weapons in her arsenal and the spars she had been offered by several centurions once their shifts had ended or had yet to begin had given much more information. Her weapons appeared to be an equal mixture of brought and custom made and those that fell into the second category were very well made. Elsewhere, Team Asuma silently walked behind the soldiers of the Orange Legion. Man, this is such a drag. Shikamaru may have spoken what was quickly becoming his catchphrase but he did not stop or complain about their slow pursuit. All I wanted to do was talk to Naruto about some of the stuff going on and he's in this mad rush to go to the Hokage Tower. Why couldn't he stick around the gates for a few more minutes? You kind of just sat there when he showed up. Choji was walking at his side, a bag of chips in hand as he ate handful after handful. It was the second bag since the team had chosen to watch for the return of Team 7 to the village. Why didn't you just go up to him before he left with Sasuke? I was thinking about some things. Mainly the way the clones had all vanished. There were too many puzzle pieces strewn around in his head for him to snap out of his thoughts and go after Naruto. And those guys that followed him didn't exactly look friendly. Yeah. Ino spoke up from where she walked with their sensei. Asuma-sensei, what do you think about what happened? When those clones tried to attack Kakashi? Asuma exhales a stream of smoke from his nose before he lowered the cigarettes from his lips. You really shouldn't worry about it so much Ino. It wasn't like he couldn't take them down if he was really in trouble. Then what about Sasuke Kuen? The volume of Ino's voice made all three men on the team wince. Why is he following that dead last around like he's some bodyguard? You should talk to Sakura about that. Asuma deflected the question to the pink-haired Genin on the team. She probably knows why he's doing it. Maybe Naruto promised him something. The fact that the Uchiha was listening to the former dead last of the academy had drawn more than a little curiosity from the shinobi that had gathered after the near-disaster Naruto's clones had caused on the day of the testing. A few of the Yamanaka had been looking over what they knew from ANBU observations during Team 7's days before the escort mission to Nami no Kuni and so far hadn't come up with much. The only thing that had sprung up was a betting pool over the two's daily spars. You're right, Forehead would know all about why Sasuke Kuen is listening to Naruto Baka. Asuma silently distanced himself from the blonde Genin. The maniacal gleams in her eyes made him somewhat worry over the fate of Kakashi's student. I'll make sure to find out everything she knows. Then I'll make sure Sasuke Kuen stops following that idiot around and he'll love me for it. Damn it Ino. Shikamaru wanted to put his head in his hands as several of Naruto's clones abruptly broke away from the formation at a run. They ducked into an alley and he had no idea where they ended up going before six at the end of the formation turned around and formed a wall out of their shields and a hand fell to the swords at their waist. No doubt Ino's shouts had alerted them to their tails. Halt. The six clones spoke as one and Shikamaru didn't exactly like the look in their blue eyes. They weren't a lot like the Naruto he thought he knew before he had heard about him graduating from some special lessons. The same blue eyes had once been the cage for a mad brilliance and other things that simply defined Naruto to the dark-haired Genin but now they carried something else that he couldn't exactly pin down. The only thing he could say for certain he found in them was an immeasurable pride. Hey. He raised a hand in greeting as he and Choji came to a stop. You guys mind if I talk to Naruto? Praetor is not among us. One of the six spoke this time as the shields were suddenly removed from where they had been all but slammed into the ground and returned to their place at their sides with their arms. One of the clones stepped forward, the same one that had spoken, and the other six fell back and their hands remained on their swords. Shikamaru, Choji, Ino, let's go. Asuma strode forward with his hands in his pocket, 
his cigarette extinguished beneath his sandal a few paces behind him. His eyes roamed over the six clones before he walked between the two genin. I'm pretty sure the Hokage has a mission for us. Yeah, almost forgot. Shikamaru nodded and followed after his sensei with the two other genin as he leaped onto the rooftops. I guess I'll talk to him at the Hokage Tower then. Unbidden, Shikamaru couldn't stop the lazy grin slowly spreading over his face. It'll be a surprise meeting. Catching up with an old friend I guess. The grin fell away faster than it had arrived. If Naruto even has people he calls friends anymore. The easygoing days at the academy came to mind then. Him, Choji, Kiba, and Naruto spending day after day together only to be yelled out by Irika sensei and stuck in detention where the teacher would lecture them some more. Naruto had laughed off most of what he said but would show up in class for a few days. He would pull a few pranks but he wouldn't ditch class for a while. He dragged the other three in the room with him, saying something about the future Hokage needing friends almost as smart as him. After he said that, Kiba would start shouting at him and then, some of the time at least, the two would get into a fight over who would be the better Hokage. Akameru would no doubt get involved somehow, and he and Choji would just laugh at the two. Man, memories are such a drag sometimes. He ran a hand down his face. His hand came away wet. All this sudden exercising was making a lazy guy like him sweat. Ah, it seems someone wants to talk to me. A grin spread across his face as he removed a hand from his ear. Two people if the reports are correct. The first sixth centurion is nearby, should I order him to assemble his century outside? Sasuke spoke up from where he leaned against the wall next to Naruto. Both had been waiting for their Jonin sensei and Sakura to show up. The eyes of the Orange Legion pursued them over the village as Kakashi stopped more times than was necessary. So far he had picked up Dango, picked up more shuriken and kanai, went by the kennels kept by the Inazuka and talked for a few minutes with a few of the clan members. Went into a tree to feed a family of squirrels, and gone around the village when a cat crossed his path. It wasn't even black, an old rust-colored one. He'll arrive in several minutes. No. My Praetorians are enough and I do not feel like aggravating our watchers anymore. Down either end of the hall, his Praetorians had dispersed themselves and prevented travel to the Hokage's office. Several shouting matches had occurred but nothing more than that. The sheer power that continued to pour out of the blonde Uzumaki waiting by the door to the office made many reconsider picking a fight with the clones blocking their way. The trio of ANBU Black Ops agents standing at either end of the hall in a silent staring match with the soldiers of the Orange Legion also helped send many off to fulfill other duties they suddenly remembered having. The sight amused the Praetor of the Orange Legion to no end. That's pretty smart Naruto. Both genin started off the wall when Kakashi was suddenly between them. Naruto recovered quickly and chuckled as Sakura stepped down the hall and the Praetorian silently stepped out of the way for her before reforming their line. I knew I made the right decision when I named you team leader. Your skills are great to silently bypass all of my Praetorian silver fong. Naruto spoke no more as he turned to the door to the Hokage office and opened it. I truly can hardly wait for the day my glorious legion at last surpasses such a great power. I shall enjoy the day when you learn the errors of your ways. You kids. Blades were not drawn when Kakashi patted Naruto on the head only because the Praetorians had not seen the deed. They did not see Kakashi silently step past Naruto into the room and beckon for the genin to follow. They did feel Praetor's rage through the chakra suddenly flooding the halls. They turned and marched back to the door. Hokage-sama. Kakashi bowed his head towards the village leader as the three genin formed a line in front of him. Sakura was once again in the center, directly in front of him, and Naruto and Sasuke were on his right and left respectively. Team 7 reporting in. Ah, Team 7 at last. Hiruzen Sarutobi let a smile cross over his aged face as he set down his pen for the moment. I've been waiting for your appearance all morning, Kakashi. He let his elbows rest on the top of his desk and leaned forward, his interlocked fingers resting at his nose. Tell me, what is the status of your C-rank escort mission to the Land of Waves? Team 7's mission to the Land of Waves was a success Hokage-sama. Kakashi was grinning underneath his mask. I named Naruto team leader so I'm sure he can tell you all the details. The Jonin laid a hand on Naruto's armored shoulder. Isn't that right, Naruto? 
You are testing many things with your actions, Silver Fong. Naruto strode forward, almost jerking his shoulder free of Kakashi's grip to some, and stopped in front of the Hokage's desk. I am pleased to inform you Sarutobi Gigi that the land of waves has fallen under the banner of my mighty Uzumaki Empire. The Hokage stared blankly forward for a moment before his arms followed a well-practiced movement, more like a routine in truth. He drew out his pipe from underneath his desk. The smoking instrument was swiftly loaded with tobacco and lit before the Hokage brought it to his lips. He took a deep breath and exhaled the smoke. Could you repeat that Naruto Kuen and, this time, leave out no details? Hiruzen was met with an eager grin from Naruto, something similar to the smiles of mere months ago when he had still been an academy student but it was utterly separate at the same time. I shall. Naruto held out his hand and in a puff of smoke a scroll appeared in it. I am pleased to announce that the Uzumaki Empire has cleared waves of banditry and my third cohort has been stationed there to prevent the return of such filth. As I am not omnipresent, I have elected to name a well-known and respected man named Kaiza to be the vicarious of Nami no Kuni. The client, Tazuna, had faced threats from a man known as Gato so I killed him. What? The Hokage's words made Naruto's blue eyes widen at something he was completely foreign to coming from the man and directed at him. It was the anger in them. You killed Gato? Yes. He swiftly recovered. His business interests directly caused the plague of bandits on my land so I committed a takeover of his interests. All he once owned has now become the property of my Uzumaki empire. I did not dismantle his shipping industry if you believe so. I have merely placed the vicarious of Nami no Kuni in charge of it now. My third cohort has also deemed itself capable of expanding to better patrol my new territory. I have authorized such a thing and soon I shall command orange legions. Naruto set the scroll down on the desk. As a shinobi of Kanoha, I have given the order for a great amount of detail to be committed to the scroll you see before you now. It describes all I have spoken of in much more detail from the initial journey to the campaign of war I unleashed upon the filth polluting my lands. Naruto stepped away and bowed to the aged Hokage. I gift this to you Hokage-sama. I will look over this as soon as I can Naruto Kuen. Blue eyes did not remain locked with old eyes. They swiftly left as he turned around. I also wish to inform you of the success of the mission you assigned to Team 7 Sarutobijiji. Tazuna survived with no injuries and his bridge was complete. At this, Naruto chuckled but it was a hollow one. It has been named the Great Hope Bridge by the man we were assigned to protect. It was clear Naruto hated the name. I see. Hiruzen leaned back in his chair, his pipe once again brought up to his lips. I will perhaps call you all in individually in the coming days and ask for reports from all of you. Naruto will be excluded as he has given me one I will look over with the others. Just to be safe, I'm ordering the rest of the team to complete your reports within a time span of two days from now and send them to me. He exhaled a breath of smoke. That will be all Team 7, you are dismissed. Ha! Huh. Hokage-sama. For voices spoke together and the moment they were out of the doors they ran into Team 8. Kurinai. Kakashi. The two jonin greeted each other with nods of their heads, mutual respect in a working relationship, but the genin were different. My Praetorians need more training I see. Chakra ripped through the hallway as a blue streaked wind and roused the fallen Praetorians strewn outside the door from their genjutsu-induced slumber. Power shined in the blue eyes of the blonde Uzumaki before he turned to the active Sharingan of his legate. He ignored the distasteful sight of his Praetorian staggering back to their feet and retrieving their fallen weapons. I expect this not to happen again Legate. I will pursue solutions with all I am able to Praetor. Sasuke's eyes looked over the clones for a moment before returning to Naruto's and brought his fist over his heart. Such a disgrace shall not stain the records of your legion again. I will hold you to it. Naruto's eyes roved over the three genin that stood behind Kurinai as the jonin glanced from him to Sasuke, curiosity shining in her eyes. I see you have a team with you Yuhisan. I feel more ashamed by Praetorians didn't detect the approach of genin before falling to your genjutsu. So, looks like the rumors are true. Naruto's eyes shifted to Kiba as the Inazuka strode forward with the small and white Akamaru in his jacket like always. You've gotten really good with that shadow clone jutsu you leaned. Enough to think you can say what you want to anybody no matter what their rank is. He stepped forward and growled. 
So, my big question for you right now, what the hell did you hit your head on, Naruto? What's got you acting like this? Naruto did not answer. His gaze settled on Kiba's own for a second before he pointedly turned to observe the other two members of Team 8. Hey! I'm talking to Y- Dash. he stepped forward and was stopped when a hand grabbed hold of his shoulder. You seem to be under the impression Preter has to answer you. Sasuke's Sharingan locked with the near feral eyes of the Inazuka from Naruto's wordless dismissal of him. I will tell you to drop such delusions now or you will not live to regret having them. His free hand rested on the sword at his side. You should know better than to demand anything of Preter. I'm not afraid of your fancy eyes. Kiba jerked his shoulder away from his loose grip and his hands tightened into fists at his side. If you think you can stop me, go ahead and try and take me on. There's your mistake in Azuka. I don't think I can beat you, I know I can. Sasuke's sword was partially out of the sheath when a hand grabbed hold of his wrist. Well, this is over with. Kakashi's single visible eye was closed as he forced Sasuke's hand to move and place the sword back in its scabbard. A tighter grip forced him to release his grip on the sword and he pulled Sasuke away from a now grinning Kiba without another word. We're going to talk later Sasuke. Kakashi released the Uchiha and looked to Kurinai. See? This is why I'm no good with kids. You shouldn't say that. Kurinai looked towards Naruto. Some kids are born rotten. Kakashi and his team vanished without another word from the masked Jonin. Kurinai looked at the spot he had been at for only a moment longer before she turned and walked back down the hall. Teammate followed her without a word of complaint. Her desire for a new mission for the Genin was forgotten for now as a new desire had taken hold of her mind. She had to go talk to two specific people right now and hopefully get some answers. She ran into one of the two she was looking for right down the hall. Asuma was leaning against the wall, the two teams seamlessly joining together and intermingling as the Jonin sensei of each walked side by side. It wasn't long before they came across Guy and his team outside and the nine Genin were sent off to training ground 8 with the promise of the Jonin's arrival within the next few hours. We need to talk. The three spoke together before all three vanished in a swiftly conjoined cloud of smoke. In the days following Team 7's return from the Land of Waves, word had spread of Naruto's conquest of the entire island country and his new ownership of Gato's numerous businesses, both those deemed legal by most and those deemed illegal by others. The missions that had been regularly handed out to the hidden villages had swiftly come to an end with a notice being sent out, a great number of recent internal changes to the company has brought with them the need to temporarily bring all shipping and trading to a halt. The number of complaints that the Hokage had been bombarded with had been high but truly only four stood out among the stack after stack of soon to be tinder. He also considered giving them to the Kanoha aviary as well. The Mizukage had spoken of the strangeness of the sudden shift in ownership. The Rakage had spoken of the necessity of keeping a large shinobi force occupied. The Tsuchikage had spoken of the fragile state of some villages compared to others. The Kazekage had spoken of the alliance between villages, the necessity for the spread of information. The four leaders of the other hidden villages had aired their grievances to him with terse responses. All could be summed up the same way in the end, things were to return to normal or else. The aged Hokage had not sent a reply as of yet. He had just finished reading the final report from Team 7, Kakashi's, and now sat in quiet contemplation once he had burned it to ash. The Jonin had been very thorough and had left no details out. The fact that Zabuza Momoichi was currently employed by Naruto spoke volumes of the amount of money Gato had. Momoichi was a very expensive mercenary to hire to kill a simple bridge builder. The fact he was still hired spoke of how much money Naruto had taken from the dead man. His squad of powerful Kekiai Genkai wielders from the purges in Mizu no Kuni he had trained to become brutal assassins had also found employment under the umbrella of the Genin's recent hiring of their teacher. Hiruzen was simply glad that they remained in Nami no Kuni for the moment. He could breathe easier knowing his problems were limited to the immediate and not far and distant ones. All he had to deal with was the fact that Naruto had conquered an entire island country and also controlled one of the largest corporations in the world. The blonde had listed his new assets in his reports and ANBU were currently compiling a number of files related to each of them into a comprehensive report for him. It would take a week at minimum. This is going to be a long few weeks. 
I hope you haven't forgotten that the Chunin exams are approaching, Hiruzen. I haven't. Danzo Shimura sat across from him. The two elderly shinobi had been working in silence for the most part once the former council member had been called to Hiruzen's office and had offered him several scrolls which had already been read through. All of them concerned Naruto's Uzumaki Empire from the initial actions taken in Konoha, such as taking over the Uchiha district, the movement of his second and fourth cohorts in the ruins of Yuzushiovikure and lands nearby, and third cohorts actions in Nami no Kuni as they rapidly grew into another orange legion for Naruto to command, and the continued near eruption of chakra from Naruto for the past few days since his return and near complete separation from other shinobi thanks to his first cohort and Praetorians. On his last count, eight censors that had been responsible for the barrier around Kanoha had been sent to the hospital with heavy migraines. If this continued the way it was, he wouldn't have many more left and that would pose too many problems to think about. Danzo had handled the most recent replacements with several suggestions and nothing out of the norm had come out of the censor department for the past few hours. Hiruzen was glad his fellow shinobi had solved the potential security disaster. You will need additional security depending on how many teams are sent to the exams by the competing villages and how many manage to reach the finals. Danzo spoke and near the wall the white-coated ANBU commander nodded. Some will need to be visible to the untrained eye and others invisible to even the most watchful of eyes. It'll be done. Kanoha's shinobi will need to be on guard and cautious to act with so many foreign shinobi entering the village. The Jonin commander, Shikaku Nara, spoke up from his position near the window, his shadow filling the room as several scrolls were held suspended in hands of shadow. Kakashi will also need to learn to rein that kid in if he's going to have his team compete in the Chunin exams. We don't need an international incident because he decided to talk big to any of the other Kage that'll be showing up. That's unlikely to happen. Danzo spoke before Hiruzen did. The darker side of their world almost broke into laughter and gained curious, even fearful, looks from those in the office. Naruto Uzumaki continues to prove that he is not only unpredictable but shows he will soon be a powerful force in our world. His creation of his army, completely unknown to all of us until the day of Hataki's test, shows precisely how dangerous he can become. We've all read the reports on what his Orange Legion really is, that should be enough to tell us all what he is capable of. Indeed. Hiruzen's voice was grave as he looked towards one of the scrolls on his desk. You've all destroyed the information, correct? Hi. All three spoke together. All three knew how dangerous the information they had discovered truly was. It was almost insulting to believe any of them had allowed the information to fall into the wrong hands, to even exist for longer than it took to read and recover from their shock at what it contained. Good. Less detailed copies have been circulated to the ANBU and Jonin of the village but, as you all know, Kakashi Hitaki has been granted access to all information and he has been made the one responsible for compiling future reports once the ANBU were discovered. Hiruzen's words were met with a series of nods. What of Hitaki's friends? They could possibly discover the truth behind the boy's army and they may spread it, intentional or otherwise. They should be dealt with, at least two of them. Danzo spoke and the ANBU commander responded. An old friend will be responsible for reports on the three. The reports I receive will decide what happens to them. Beneath his mask, the ANBU commander's eyes drifted to the shadows. Understood? Silence was his answer but he did not expect vocal acknowledgement more than he expected them to appear from the shadows. The shadows he observed with unseen eyes had become thinner, had gained a lighter darkness to them. The ANBU that had once been stationed inside had vanished. You shouldn't doubt Kakashi. Hiruzen set the scroll down as it began to burn away. He can, and still does, surprise me with his actions. I'm sure he can handle the situation without any of us intervening. He is a man with a plan for nearly everything. In training ground 7? I do not have a plan for this. Kakashi spoke mainly to himself as he hung upside down from a tree branch. He was currently in such a position because he had found reason to silently observe the three genin that were his responsibility until they were promoted to Chunin or, as unlikely as it was, died. His Sharingan eye was unveiled as he continued to look over one of the three genin that had been assigned to him and he tried to put his natural genius to use to figure out why bad things kept happening to him. All he ever did was be hours late to anything not deemed urgent. 
Sure, he had made plenty of people angry and make them swear vengeance on him, but he had never done anything to deserve the headache one of his students had turned out to be. His Sharingan focused on the blonde in front of him for several seconds before he realized he could come up with no answer to even one of his questions. Naruto Uzumaki's chakra continued to flow out of him with no end in sight and had, within an hour, saturated the entirety of the training ground they resided in. The jonin sighed as he moved one hand and readjusted the headband that denoted his allegiance to Kanahagakur to once again cover it. He stopped the flow of chakra to his feet and landed silently in a crouch on the forest floor before he vanished in a cloud of smoke. Hey! He silently appeared before the three genin with a single hand rose in greeting before it fell down to his side. You three are still alive. The Orange Legion does not falter at any challenge. Naruto's grin never wavered as he rested a hand on the hilt of his blade. You should do well to remember that Silver Fong for the day will come that you shall be the challenge my glorious legion shall not only face but overcome. Don't you mean legions now? Kakashi's comment was met with loud boisterous laughter from the Uzumaki that he had foolishly made his responsibility when he passed him. Despite the fact, he nodded along to the message he took from the laughter. Ah, so you don't count your expanded forces yet? You are correct Silver Fong. Naruto's laughter was replaced by chuckling before it was gone entirely before he rose a clenched fist into the air. The Orange Legion's third cohort may expand to greater and greater heights the more time passes but it is not yet deserving of the title of Legion. It is especially not deserving of a title of one of my Orange Legions but time shall show it deserves such a name. Until then, it is still nothing but a cohort of my Great Orange Legion. Once the time comes to pass, I shall command legions but for now I still command only a single glorious orange legion of my mighty Uzumaki empire. Blue eyes shined with delight at what the future held, the power he would hold, the force of arms that fewer and fewer would ever be able to stand against. Soon none will be able to muster arms against my mighty and glorious Uzumaki empire and on that day the world shall tremble and rejoice at my absolute rule. Alright then. Kakashi felt the need to turn to Sakura for some sanity amongst the team as Sasuke had turned and saluted Naruto with the universal one used by his clones. Sakura, I'm going to work on your chakra control while those two spar. You shall not silver fong. Naruto's blade was suddenly drawn and the idle Praetorians erupted into action. They formed a circle around the two and blades were drawn and shields were pointed towards the jonin that stood next to their praetor. You shall not have the time of Sakura-chan today. My centurions of my glorious legion shall train her in the swordplay she seemed so eager in making use of. He turned his eyes to her but never fully turned them away from the lax Kakashi for more than a few seconds so blue shined from the corners of his eyes. He grinned at her and ignored the almost fear that shined in her green eyes. Sakura-chan shall learn to fight in the way of my great Uzumaki empire. No. Kakashi spoke the simple word and didn't move as the ring of swords and steel closed once the clones took a step inward and pointed to Naruto and Sasuke. I let you two spar all the time because you don't need much in the way of training since you've both got tree walking and water walking down in the past few days. Sakura, on the other hand, needs personal training because her control is abysmal. It's not saying much since most of her skills are abysmal from what I've seen but it's what I'm focusing on today and I'll hopefully see some progress from her. At his words, the pink-haired genin seemed to deflate and the circle around the two shinobi drew tighter. You two can learn kenjutsu and some ninjutsu from me later but for now you'll be happy with the leniency I'm giving you while I train your teammate up to standard. You two are not to leave the training grounds by the way. Take that as an order from your jonin sensei. Kakashi swore the clones around him actually growled then. He ignored them and stepped out the circle to grab hold of a startled Sakura's shoulder. Besides, Sakura's my favorite out of you three. He vanished and Naruto allowed his humor to vanish. His teeth were bared to the world as his lips curled with fury. He wanted to do nothing more than strike down the one he had deemed Silver Fong but just as swiftly as his anger had appeared it vanished. Centurion, keep watch on Silver Fong from a distance. Sasuke pressed a finger to his ear and issued the order to the faraway centurion, one who had been issued surveillance equipment his century had dispersed throughout the forest. Do not lose sight of him. He will not escape the sights of my men. The centurion answered back and the connection was cancelled as Sasuke drew his finger away from his ear. 
The eyes of the Legion will one day not fall to the Jenjutsu of Shinobi but until that day comes we must remain reliant on surveillance equipment. Naruto spoke the words seemingly to himself before he turned to the legate of his Orange Legion. Legate, I expect a truly ripe fruit from the labors of your training one of these days. I shall aim to provide a bountiful harvest on that day Praetor. Sasuke raised a fist over his armored heart as he bowed his head to the ruler of the Uzumaki Empire. Now, his head shot up and his Sharingan came to life, his eyes shining with a red light. What do you say to a spar Praetor? His answer was the drawing of a blade from his side and he grinned as the Uchiha did the same. Both held out their hands and their shields appeared from recent additions to their armor. I thought you would never ask. The sound of steel meeting steel rung out as the two met in a clash, their faces split by battle-hungry and bloodthirsty grins. They would not stop until a winner had been decided. This spot should be good. Kakashi had made two shadow clones the moment he had vanished with Sakura and thrown off the Orange Legion watchers he had seen setting up equipment across the forest. One clone had transformed into Sakura and the training they had come to expect had begun, him hounding her as he ran her through beginner's shuriken jutsu, jinjutsu, and taijutsu with random trivia questions interspersed through it all. Kakashi Sensei, where are we? Sakura had gotten rather good at not feeling nauseous from the truly insane speed Kakashi traveled at and looked around at the rocky and barren terrain around them. It's a place more out there. I'm borrowing it to train you. Kakashi put his hands in his pockets before turning to a massive rectangular rock more than double his height that was nearby and gestured towards it with his sandal-clad foot. Go on and smash this rock for me. What? Sakura was shocked for a second, rightfully so, before a look from Kakashi calmed her down. He had perfected the ability to smile with his eye during his childhood and used it now. You know I'm not super strong like Naruto and Sasuke, Kakashi-sensei. Isn't there something else I can do? Just trust me on this one Sakura. Kakashi drew a hand out of his pocket and patted the nearby rock on the side from next to it. Sakura briefly looked from where he had just been standing to where he now was before sighing and walking over. I'm sure you'll do fine. Hey all right then Kakashi sensei. I need a second. She balled her hands into a fist and couldn't help but close her eyes as she drew it back with the rest of her body. Her entire body tensed for a moment before she threw all she had into the blow. Her mind was entirely focused on striking the rock and hopefully not breaking her hand in too many places to count. Shinaro. Let's see if I'm right. His Sharingan eye was revealed to the world as he stepped back and took in the sight. Her fist struck the rock. The rock shattered. A stun Sakura nearly fell forward if he hadn't wrapped an arm around her waist and leapt into the air just in time. The ground rumbled for only a moment before it simply caved in, a jagged cavernous maw swallowing up the earth before it collapsed in on itself. What the hell? The airborne genin in his arms could only scream at the sight below her before Kakashi landed on a rock spire farther away. He used his free hand to once again hide his Sharingan and took a moment to take in the destruction below him with his own eye. Yep, it looks like you have quite the ability. Kakashi sat her down on the narrow pillar and wasn't surprised when she easily held on, her chakra instantly grabbing hold of the rock below her even if her arms shot out and wrapped around one of his own. You're a natural at something that took the creator years to get the hang of. Please tell me what you're talking about. Sakura was in no danger of falling but she didn't seem to understand that was the case so he would show her. He vanished from sight and appeared lower on the rock, his feet holding him sideways as he looked up at the pink-haired Jenin who closed her eyes as she awaited her fall to the earth. When nothing happened she tentatively opened one eye and met Kakashi's sole visible eye below her. Congratulations Sakura, you have the best chakra control I've ever seen. He gave her another eye smile. She was a natural at tree walking and water walking was the same, a single step on the water was all it took to get it down. Her strength was at truly monstrous levels despite her rather poor physical condition because she was a natural at using the technique of a Sanin in chakra enhanced strength. It was even better than Tsunade's version from what Kakashi had researched and what he had just seen. He truly had a future monster of a shinobi on his hands. Your mind is one of the sharpest I've ever seen, most Nara don't compare. He walked back up the spire and stepped upright. Her intelligence was another thing that couldn't be ignored. She was smarter than most Nara clan members and, an upside not many of them could boast about, 
was easily motivated judging from the rigor that she had pursued Sasuke with. Her mind was partly responsible for why she was able to have such phenomenal chakra control in the first place as it, in his theory at least, contributed to her just demonstrated strength. He would call it a monstrous thing. You're going to be great. Tentatively, she let her own smile spread across her face as she looked down at her fist. Kakashi-sensei, can I ask a favor real quick? What is it? Can you turn around so I can change out of this stuff? She gestured down to the armor dotting her form and Kakashi couldn't help but let his eye smile grow. I've got a spare set of clothes sealed away. Just call if you need me. He vanished in a puff of smoke and settled down behind a boulder quite a distance away. He would give her plenty of privacy. He personally couldn't wait to see Naruto's expression when Sakura unveiled the fruits of her labors with him. She would quickly grow to outstrip both of them if she kept to her strengths. Once he really began training her once the first rounds of the exams were over with, she'll be a true monster that would put the legend Tsunade of the Sanin had garnered for herself to shame. She would perhaps rise to be a goddess of shinobi with her skills given enough time and training, two things he would make sure she received ample amounts of. He would only accept greatness from her. Unlike Naruto and Sasuke, you don't really know what you can do, do you Sakura? An image of the Uchiha he taught came to mind. His Sharingan, Ninjutsu, Jinjutsu, Taijutsu, and all those other skills he has makes you think you can't measure up but you're wrong. He had come to learn the many weaknesses of Sasuke Uchiha in his time observing his three students. Arrogant, prideful, obsessed with vengeance, and more personality issues than most ANBU. He'll go mad one day. Next came Naruto and the Jonin side. Your teammate is no better. Taijutsu, chakra reserves that put most Kage, past and present, to shame, his mastery of that Kinjutsu of his, and his status as the Jinchuriki, you must really think he's far ahead of you. Both of them can do incredible things and you think you're hardly even average. He could imagine where Sakura saw herself then. She was constantly chasing after her two teammates, always running behind them and struggling to catch up. She had taken a backseat role in the bell test, relegated to a watcher by Naruto's army of clones, while Naruto and Sasuke retrieved the bells. During the time between then and the escort mission to Nami no Kuni, she was hardly able to breathe, let alone train, with all the blossom guards Naruto forced on her. She must have felt stifled, suffocated, like she was nothing but a piece of delicate glassware wrapped and put away for safekeeping. She must have felt like nothing more than a burden when compared to what Naruto and Sasuke could do. She couldn't fight like them. She couldn't move like them. She didn't think like them. Being like those two is overrated, Sakura. Kakashi almost chuckled at the thought. You have more potential than they ever did. An image of the red and black eyes of the Uchiha came to his mind. Sasuke will never surpass his brother while relying on the same eyes he has. An image of Naruto followed next, clad in the armor of his orange legion with a massive portion of his created force behind him. Naruto, we'll be lucky if he doesn't cause a war or two between the rest of the world and his Uzumaki empire. He's a mad conqueror who'll hopefully burn out before he does anything too dangerous to either himself or the village. But you? The genin appeared to his mind's eye. He leaned back against the boulder he waited behind and the corners of his mask moved up as he smiled. You've got nothing weighing you down or clouding your judgment. No fancy dojitsu and no crazy kenjutsu in your bag of tricks. All you can do is improve yourself or not advance at all. You'll earn every bit of strength through training, master every new technique with not only that scarily sharp mind of yours but determination to not give up until you get it done, and you'll become a legend after you gain those legendary skills because you fought for them every step of the way. Unbidden, an image of his self-proclaimed rival appeared next to Sakura. He had seen Gai go from a child regularly mocked to a legend among shinobi with his raw skill and was glad he could call the man a friend. He was someone for people to actually look up to, someone who didn't fail the people that relied on him. Guy was someone who didn't need any special eyes or natural genius to achieve greatness as long as he could push himself past his limits day in and day out. Guy was someone that was the epitome of what hard work and the determination to never give up could give you. He was far greater than the man called a prodigy since birth, a genius destined for great things. He was a true shinobi of Kanoha, unlike himself. Kakashi Sensei. Her voice called out to him and he rose from where he had been resting. Over here. 
He lifted a single hand and she came rushing over to him dressed like she was when Team 7 had still been unofficial. The armor of the Orange Legion lay discarded behind her, strewn across the ground among the already present rubble. Kakashi couldn't help but smile at the sight. Yes. He was certain of it all now. Sakura would go farther than both Naruto and Sasuke no matter what. All that he had to do was make sure she understood the first step on the path to greatness was one that began far from it. It would be painful. It would be torture. She would probably grow to hate him for putting her through it all but greatness wasn't obtained without cost. I'm definitely going to make you a legend, Sakura. The copy ninja smiled beneath his mask. Those on the streets of Konoha were witness to Naruto Uzumaki and Sasuke Uchiha walking the streets with a ring of Praetorians around the two. Legit, how far has the word spread? Training had lasted well into the afternoon before the two had decided to stop. Now the Legit and Praetor walked back to the Orange Legion's main camp while the first cohort remained in camp within Konoha, the conquered Uchiha district. The last time I checked, all Centurions had passed the words on to their men. The entire Legion has been informed of what happened in Nami no Kuni. Sasuke's Sharingan locked with blue eyes as he offered the Uzumaki a smirk. Trust me Praetor, I was very thorough. I have no doubt. Naruto let out a brief chuckle as the wall of shields blocking the road into the Uchiha district was wordlessly disassembled before the two highest ranking members of the Orange Legion. It was just as swiftly reassembled as they passed by line after line, a full century in total. I see the first cohort has been busy as always in our absence. Indeed they have. Sasuke and Naruto both came to a stop to look at the repurposed Uchiha district. It was no longer a desolate place inhabited by nearly no one but was now dominated by the ranks of the Legion. Construction had long been underway to raise barracks, forges, communication hubs, armories and more by the soldiers of Naruto's first cohort. The district itself had been refurbished heavily, the flags of the Legion and the first cohort hanging across the district. Security had been increased with the addition of several more centuries as currently the district played host to a meeting between the heads of each cohort of the Orange Legion. They awaited Praetor near the center of the district, the building they were meeting in surrounded by a ring of Praetorians. The rooftops of the entire district were covered by the sharp eyes of the men of the Orange Legion and a multitude of surveillance equipment. It all wired back to multiple surveillance centers across the district and even to a hidden camp manned by a small force of Praetorians. Gato's funds have been swiftly put to use. The Legate's comments only gained a chuckle from the ruler of the Orange Legion as he stepped past twin columns of saluting soldiers. My Orange Legion has scarcely begun to use that filth's requisitioned assets. Naruto's eyes seemed to glow with a rabid anticipation of what the future held. Soon I shall command both the land and the sea with my great orange legion. The day such a thing happens shall be eagerly awaited by the entirety of your magnificent legion. Sasuke stepped after him, his eyes focused on the growing higher and higher tower every day in the center of the district. It constantly held the flag of the orange legion aloft even among the uncompleted framework and high above even it rested the flag of the Uzumaki Empire. Your enemy shall learn to fear another domain ruled by the might of your Uzumaki Empire on that day as well. They shall learn many things about fear legit, many things that shall drive them to beg for my mercy, for my rule. Naruto stepped into the open doors of the tower and Sasuke followed after him without hesitation. Only darkness greeted them once ten Praetorians drew the doors close with their combined strength split across the two. Now, let us see if this meeting can begin. A long and dark sloping tunnel was walked through within minutes by the two, Praetorians of the Legion saluting Naruto at regularly spaced intervals. At the end four Praetorians stood at attention with their shields held up and their blades clenched in their hands. Praetor. All four spoke as one and they swung inward without another word spoken. Naruto stepped past them and at last entered the underground meeting room the first cohort of his Legion had been busy with excavating since he had laid claim to the land above them. It is a great thing to see you all before me. Naruto took his seat at the head of the mostly occupied table while the five seats on either side of the table were, save for one, already occupied by the centurions that headed the cohorts of his legion. Behind him at his immediate right stood the prefectus castrorum of his praetorians and at the opposite end of the table the legate sat under the hanging banner of his personal force, 
the Uchiwa of the Uchiha wrapped by the red swirl of the Uzumaki. Changes had of course been made to it once the march back to Nami no Kuni had begun on Naruto's order which only lead to the inclusion of a ring of flames set around the two clan symbols. Four of his cohorts had been bloodied so four personalized banners hung above their heads. The centurion of the first cohort, to his left, sat with the hounds of Silver Fong hanging above him. Next to him, the centurion of the second cohort sat with his standard, the Uzumaki swirl holding a bloodied blade pointing downward and two others crossed behind it, equally as bloodied. The centurion of the third cohort, sitting next to the second, sat beneath his official standard, the Uzumaki swirl holding within it a wave and against it stood the shields of the third cohort. The centurion of the fourth cohort, sitting next to the third, sat beneath the banner of the Uzumaki swirl holding the silhouette of distant ruins with the men of the fourth standing before it. The six other centurions sat with only the blank standard, a deep orange with the swirl of the Uzumaki empire with the number of the cohort they commanded underneath it. V for the fifth, six for the sixth, seven for the seventh, eight for the eight, nine for the ninth, and X for the tenth. Between each standard of the bloodied cohorts and of those not yet given such an opportunity, the banner of the Uzumaki Empire hung from the walls. The Uzumaki swirl placed on a white background, simplicity winning out over his desire to make it a grand thing. One change had come across it since his return as the kanji four waves rested directly above the swirl in jet black with its place not unlike the place of the number 12 on a clock. Naruto's arms swept out and his grin was wide as he rose, his blue eyes shine with something that few present could identify. Not even the centurions before him had a chance before it was gone. Only the wielder of the Sharingan had caught a glimpse of it and filed it away to ponder on after the meeting was finished. Let us speak of what has come to pass and what has yet to do the same, let this room be the sole witness to the certainty of our future glory, and let us all remember this day for countless days and countless nights. He let his arms fall and his grin widened. Let us set in motion the grand plans of my legion and let us build upon my glorious empire with them. Glory shall be yours Praetor. Each centurion bowed his head and crossed his armored fist over his heart as one. None shall stand before the might of your legion. Death awaits all your enemies and glory awaits all those you deem worthy. Sasuke followed the example of the centurions. Then let us begin and bring those words into reality. Naruto clasped his hands in front of him and looked over the gathered leaders of his army. Who wishes to speak of their triumphs first? I shall Praetor. The centurion in charge of the entire expedition of the second and fourth cohorts rose from his seat and saluted Naruto, his fist over his armored heart. I am Centurion Uzumaki, commander of the fourth cohort of the Orange Legion of the Uzumaki Empire reporting in and I have many things to share with you, the legate, and my fellow centurions. A grin stretched over his lips, one identical to the one Naruto wore when he was nothing but pleased with events. On the table, a box was set before Naruto and his grin seemed to widen. Within this box lies the artifact. The room became dead silent. It seemed all those present barely cared to breathe with what was set before them. Are you sure of it? Naruto's voice carried with it nothing as his blue eyes stayed locked on the box in front of him. Are you certain this is the artifact you were commanded to retrieve? I have staked my life on my certainties the moment I presented it to you, Praetor. The centurion bowed his head and Naruto didn't spend any moment longer in anticipation. He drew the knife that rested at the small of his back, the same as the knife of all those that sat in the room, and removed the bindings. The box was opened and his eyes beheld the contents inside. This shall do. He leaned back against his chair as the Uchiha turned away, rubbing at his eyes before they turned back to black. The power of the artifact you pursued is quite extraordinary, Praetor. Sasuke continued to rub at his eyes as they only continued to burn after observing the great power of the artifact. The sheer amount of chakra pouring out of it is truly incredible. The mightiest of the tailed beasts could hardly stand without fear before a wielder of such formidable strength. I was counting on such a thing. Naruto resealed the box and nodded to the centurion of the second cohort. You have done very well to bring the artifact to me undamaged. Its power will serve not only my legion well but my grand Uzumaki empire as well. He pushed the box to the side and his eyes once again roamed over those presents. Who else wishes to speak of their triumphs? I shall Praetor. 
The centurion of the third cohort rose with his fist over his heart. He unrolled a scroll in his hands and set it on the table and seals spread across it were suddenly aglow with chakra. In front of each of the leaders of the Orange Legion appeared the contents of said scroll. I am Centurion Uzumaki, commander of the third cohort of the Orange Legion of the Uzumaki Empire and I bring word of the situation in your newest lands to you, the Legate, and my fellow Centurions. None of this looks bad. The Centurion of the first cohort spoke as his eyes moved over the information presented to him. It seems that glory has brought with it a great prosperity. The lands of my Uzumaki Empire will not be given the title of squalor. Naruto's voice carried across the room before nearly chilling blue eyes turned to the standing centurion. What information is not present in this scroll, centurion? Zabuza Mamachi proves himself very capable preter. A seal was covered by the palm of the centurion's hand. He continues his assignment and Nami no Kuni is without setback to your plans with Kaiza as vicarious. The people of your new lands hold no ill will to the man and he had proven capable of increasing many of our more laborious efforts to greater and greater heights. The image before their eyes shifted as Sasuke's Sharingan reappeared in the space of a blink with the artifact no longer causing issues with its uncontained power. Soon a grand fleet shall be ready for your use Preter and the soldiers of the third cohort shall be ready and able sailors ready to sail wherever you command. This is good news. Naruto looked towards the legate of his Orange Legion at the end of the table. What do you think of the idea of such a grand fleet, legate? Only the glory of your great legion and empire matters Preter. The legate's red eyes flashed as they moved from the display in front of him to the eyes of ruler of the Uzumaki Empire that sat before him. My only issue with such a fleet would be how swiftly it could be created and the quality of the quantity of ships needed to move your grand force in any invasion. The merits of such a thing cannot be overstated. From his seat next to Naruto on the right the centurion of the 10th cohort spoke. He was one of the centurions farthest from the legate in terms of where he sat and tied for second to Preter with the centurion of the first cohort. Building a truly great fleet will take time and much material but with the wealth taken from Gato, it is not unthinkable. It is unlikely the people of Nami no Kuni will deny those they have deemed to be their protectors a magnificent fleet either. Indeed. The centurion of the seventh cohort spoke and blue eyes turned to the legate he did not sit far from, only the centurion of the sixth and centurion of the fifth separating the two. A fleet will take years to build and with it can come the assurance of quality befitting the Uzumaki Empire. If I am so opposed then I see no reason to discuss the certainty of a fleet for Preter's glorious legion any further. Sasuke looked toward each of the centurions that had spoken out, his Sharingan drifting from one to the other, before settling on the eyes of the centurion of the third cohort. With all that has been spoken I see no reason to let this one point be ignored by any who speak on it. Do not feel insulted when I ask the centurion Uzumaki but it is something I must know as legate of the glorious orange legion of Preter's Uzumaki Empire. How capable the soldiers of the third cohort shall be when the fleet you have proposed is at last ready to set sail. They shall be some of the finest in the land. I already have a century beginning their training on smaller trade vessels. I will advance them when they do not fall to the greatest trials of the sea. The centurion of the third cohort turned to Naruto once he had finished speaking to the legate. Preter, he bowed his head and saluted Naruto. That is all I have to report. This meeting has already been enlightening. Naruto grinned as his eyes moved over his centurions once more. The artifact I have sought after has at last been given to me and now I hear words of a great fleet being built for my army to sail upon the greatest and fiercest of waves on board. No conquest has yet proven unobtainable and it seems soon my Uzumaki empire will stretch from sea to sea. The blonde leaned back in his chair. Let us continue this meeting and see what else I shall learn of what future glory awaits me. One thing to note is the work of 1010, Preter. The centurion of the first cohort pressed his finger to a mark on the table and a scroll appeared before all of its occupants. She is quite skilled to do what she has done to our equipment. The scrolls were unrolled by all present. She is eager to see our weapons and improve them. I have heard of it. Naruto sat the scroll down after his eyes had taken in its content. Her excitement is admirable but she will not gain any more knowledge of my legion than what is necessary. We already have the plans from the old fool from Nami no Kuni to develop into the great weapons they will be. 
She may examine the blueprints later but she will not be given anything more than is necessary. It is not outlandish to believe she should gain some rank within the Legion if her exuberance does not fade given time. The Centurion of the Fifth Cohort closely examined the scroll before him. Her knowledge of weapons is not something to be understated by many of us. The benefits she would bring to your glorious Legion and magnificent Empire should not be ignored, Praetor. I do not wish to debate this with you, my Centurions. Naruto slid the scroll away from him and instead glanced towards the legate of his legion. Legate Sasuke, what do you have to say of such a thing, allowing a girl like Tenten to enter the ranks of my legion? I know nothing of this girl, Praetor, and can only defer to your judgment. Sasuke did not move the scroll away. Her designs are great and the wide array of new tactics implementing some of them cannot be understated. The soldiers of your legion will be quick to adapt to any new technologies of warfare and the adjustment period, if any, shall be brief. The weapons you have the first cohort constructing are things that will take time without one well versed in their uses. If she does come to join the ranks of your legion, she would provide a great degree of insight and knowledge on the weapons you intend to aid your magnificent legion in your many conquests. Your opinion is clear legate. The centurion of the second cohort turned his eyes away from the Uchiha and towards the leader of the Orange Legion and the Uzumaki Empire. What is your verdict on such a thing, Praetor? It is pointless to debate this all now. Naruto looked at all the eyes focused on him. I have not yet met the girl you all seem so intent to focus on. Schedule a meeting between the legate and myself and her. It can be here or it can be somewhere in the village. He turned to look at the Prefectus Castrorum of the Praetorians behind him. See to it that the area is secured, no matter where we are to meet. There will be nothing your Praetorians shall not know of. The Prefectus Castrorum's answer received nothing but a nod from the Uzumaki. Good. Naruto turned his focus back to the cohort Centurions and Legate in front of him and grinned. What other business is there to discuss? Much. The Legate channeled Chakra to a seal on the table. The training you commissioned across the Legion. Numerous scrolls appeared in front of each of the leaders of the Orange Legion. I have had the reports compiled and summarized for this meeting. Interesting. It was all Naruto spoke as he looked over the information the scroll contained. Very interesting. It would be written down in the records of that meeting that the smile of Naruto Uzumaki did not dim that day. I'm glad you two could make it. Guy grinned up from where he sat at his fellow two shinobi. His choice of seating was a booth not too far from the entrance and he poured both a glass from the bottle resting on the table. The two slid into the side across from him and took up their drinks. Unfortunately, I don't think my rival will be joining us tonight. He's still training that pink-haired girl? Asuma put his cigarette out in an ashtray set off to the left before taking a drink from his glass. I'm surprised he hasn't given up on her. He shouldn't. Kurinai's red eyes turned to Guy. I don't think he made the wrong choice when it came to picking her over the other two. Come now Kurinai, his other two students are not that bad. Guy grinned as he poured himself a glass and set the bottle down. Naruto has a great drive and Sasuke, well it is better he be occupied with Naruto's goal than his own at such an age. You're saying killing his brother is harder than world conquest you know. Asuma tipped back his drink, draining most of it, before setting the glass back down on the table. He sighed after a moment and rubbed at the side of his head. With what I've heard about that kid since he left, you may be right. I am certain that there are lighter topics than this to discuss. Guy was not ignorant of the somber mood that had swiftly settled over the table at the reminder of heinous act committed by Itachi Uchiha against not only Konoha but his own family as well. Let us discuss one of them instead of a traitor like him. The only other thing interesting to talk about is Kakashi's team. Kurinai's eyes drifted to the drink in her hand. He's certainly not all talk from what I've seen of him so far. He could do with a little humility but with all those clones of his it's unlikely he'll ever get a chance to know what it is. The kid's going to start a war if my old man doesn't rein him in soon enough. Asuma substituted his cigarette by polishing off his drink and accepting the offered bottle from Guy and refilled it. I wanted to do it the night Kakashi decided to pass that team of his but he decided to listen to that brat instead. The Sarutobi's tone was more than a little spiteful as he started on his second glass. I wished he had so we wouldn't have to deal with the kid's ridiculous cockiness now. You're holding a grudge against a simple genin you know. 
Guy's grin was a bit cheeky as he took the bottle back from the Sarutobi clan member and somewhat echoed his earlier words. He sat the bottle back down on the table and looked to both of his fellow Jonin. Since Kakashi is absent, it is boring to talk about his team so I shall instead begin the discussion on our own. Both Jonin hid their sighs at such a thing with a well-placed cough. Guy either didn't notice or ignored their reactions as his eyes shined with pride. Lee's flames of youth truly burned bright today as he completed his sixth lap around Kanoha on his hands with a boulder balanced on his feet. His passion for improvement and his dedication to becoming a ninja of pure taijutsu skills continues to astound me. Both swore they saw a tear come from Guy's eye as he spoke of his pupil. That is not to say anything less of my other two students through. They both excelled at their own training today as 1010 has improved her accuracy against a dozen targets and Niji continues to impress me in our brief spars together. He even succeeded in countering several of my more pressing blows with his mastery of the gentle fist. Guy had swiftly ascended to the table, one foot planted on it as he rose his cup into the air. I believe we must toast the great passion for the will of fire the shinobi of this generation has shown us recently. Yeah. Of course. Both Kurinai and Asuma rose their glasses as Guy descended back to his seat and the three briefly touched their glasses together before downing them all at once. The bottle was once again held up by Guy and he refilled all three empty glasses before setting it down off to the side. Well, I don't know if my team is as impressive as yours but I'll give it a go. Asuma leaned forward, his free arm coming to rest on the table in front of him and he sighed. Let's start off with Inoichi's kid, Ino. Kurinai briefly reached up and patted him on the shoulder. She's, a different type of Kunoichi than I grew up knowing. She's got the Yamanaka clan Haydn techniques down, the sensory skills she has are impressive for a genin like her despite being from a clan, and the rest of her skills aren't things to scoff at. Overall, a good third of this generation's trio with plenty of potential. She would be one of the best of her class, perfect for the Ino Shikacho, if she wasn't always talking about that Sasuke kid. It doesn't help that she won't stop going on and on about him unless I train her until she drops from sheer exhaustion. Not proud of it but I've done it more often than I should recently. He knocked back a third of his glass before continuing. Next is Choji and he's a good kid. A regular Akimichi from the looks of it but he's got a hell of a protective side. The Jonin smiled as he spoke. On a mission a day ago, a quick run that just involved dropping a few things off, some kids from Iwagakure coming in for the Chunin exams decided to pick a fight with the Ino Shikacho team of their generation. I let it go since it was harmless and Shikamaru went down, got buried. Choji blew up and was about to smash the kid into a paste if Shikamaru didn't come out of the trees and tell him to forget about it. Amusement shined in his eyes as he remembered the sight. The kid was cowering on the ground and, the entire time Shikamaru's talking to him, Choji's got his fist bigger than the rest of his body just hanging above the kid and ready to put it to use. A chuckle escaped the smoker before he could continue the story and Guy and Kurinai shared in it. The fury of an Akimichi, especially when protecting a comrade, was legendary among more than a few shinobi. It was especially prevalent for those that had been on the battlefields with them and seen them demolish entire enemy squads without mercy. Speaking of him, Shikamaru's been different these past few days. Asuma knocked back another third of his drink. He's gotten more focused on training, talked to his dad about learning some more of the Nara clan's Haydn techniques, and I've seen him out and around the village more instead of just cloud watching all day. He's determined to do something and, from how he's been in the past until Naruto showed back up, I'm guessing it has something to do with Kakashi's kid. I thought we weren't supposed to talk about Kakashi's team. Kurinai tried to lighten the mood but Asuma merely threw back the rest of his drink and wordlessly accepted the bottle from Guy. She briefly frowned before turning back to the contents of her own glass, red eyes focused on the swirling liquid for a moment. Since we're breaking that rule, I'm not holding anything back. She mirrored Asuma and downed some of her drink before continuing but not anywhere near as much, a fifth at best before setting it down. Hinata's got a crush on Naruto and a major one. She sighed and Asuma reached out and took her hand into his. She's been training more with her Byakugan and her gentle fist, improving by leaps and bounds really, but it's all so that she can try and impress him. She's even trying to convince Kiba and Shino to do the same before I enter them in the Chunin exams. From what I've seen, she's succeeding at it too. 
Karinai couldn't help herself but smile. Those two are really just putty in her hands half the time. Man, I'm glad Ino's not able to do that with Shikamaru and Choji. Asuma seemed to shake in horror at such a thing and a still smiling Kurinai gently squeezed his hand. Tenten simply threatens her teammates into doing whatever she requires of them with a multitude of weapons. Guy's words, in addition to the way he spoke with his proud smile and customary thumb up, drew a look of almost concern from the two jonin. You should probably talk to her about that guy. Kurinai focused back on her story with that. Kiba is an Inazuka through and through. He's not afraid of most things, is never that far from Akamaru, and I'm pretty sure he has a crush on Hinata. It's nowhere near as bad as hers is for Naruto but it's not a small thing either. He's trying to get stronger now because he wants her to forget about Naruto, he's got the idea in his head that he's too dangerous for her to be around anymore. The red-eyed Jonin sighed once more. He's not wrong. That kid is going to be nothing but trouble for anyone around him with how he's acting and I don't want her, any of my team really, anywhere near him when people stop treating him like some kind of a bad joke. Kiba's been pushing himself harder and harder every day because he can't stand the idea of Hinata getting hurt when everything eventually blows up in his face. He's doing everything he can to make sure he can beat Naruto if it ever comes to it and I'm sure he can. That kid laying him out would knock him down a peg, that's for sure. Asuma looked to Guy. What do you think? I'm not so sure we should be encouraging conflict between our students. Guy refilled his drink and placed the empty bottle at the edge of the table where it was grabbed by a passing waiter. Competition to promote drive is alright but competition out of a desire to inflict pain is not. The will of fire does not thrive off fuel filled with animosity. Such a thing dulls our springs of youth into something bitter and dark. Asuma was about to respond when Kurinai cleared her throat. Before you two get into a debate, let me finish. Kurinai took a sip of her drink once she had gotten the two's attention. Shino is a quiet boy. He keeps to himself and spends any time not training in the Aburame's Haydn techniques or working on his insects, doing, well I'm not entirely sure what he does in his free time, or even if he has much of it. Her cheeks turned red and it was not due to the minor amount of alcohol she had ingested. I honestly don't know much else about him even as his sensei. It's a bit embarrassing really. Aburame clan members aren't exactly the most open of people. Asuma swirled his drink in the glass in his hand before taking a sip of it. No shame in not knowing a lot about him. We haven't had teams for that long anyway. It'll be different in a couple months once he gets to know you. I hope so. Kurinai took the time to down the rest of her drink with Asuma following her. Well, this has been quite a talk. Guy reached into his pocket and paid the bill for the bottle without the waiter even bothering to approach. The three, normally four, Jonan were well-known customers to the bar at this point and the owner didn't worry about them paying before they left. I believe we have quite a few hours left before any of us have to leave. I've got a night mission coming up soon actually. Kurinai paid the tip as she and Asuma stepped out of the booth. I've got about another hour or two before I need to meet my team at the gate and head out. You didn't tell me about that, when are you due back? Asuma reached into his flak jacket and drew out a cigarette he placed between his lips before going for his lighter. I'll be back by noon tomorrow. Kurinai smiled as she patted him on the arm as she stepped past him. Happy now that I told you? Maybe. Asuma followed after her and Guy merely shook his head ruefully at the two. The flames of passion burn greater than many others between those two. He smiled as he followed after the two and stepped outside the bar with a wave of goodbye to the waiter. Neither of the two Jonin seemed to have any intention of moving away from the door and Guy swiftly pinpointed the reason why such a thing was the case. You ga? Guy looked to the purple-haired woman he knew was an ANBU black ops agent. She was dressed as a chunin though and her boyfriend, Hey 8 Gecko, stood with her. What are you doing here? I'm out with Hey 8 for one. Yugao smiled at the exuberant shinobi with the two shinobi's arms interlocked. And two, we're heading to go spy on Kakashi. The gleam in her eyes, something familiar to the three jonin standing in front of her, promised a certain level of mischief. Want to come? To spy on my eternal rival as he trains his students? Guy smiled as he gave her a thumb up. I shall join you and excel at such a task. I'll be embarrassed if Guy's better at spying than me. Kurinai locked arms with Asuma and pulled him forward. 
What do you two think about us heading off with a happy couple? The way Karina's eyes shined in the dying light of the sun and the way Hei ate silently told them to give up made both shinobi nod. Asuma found himself pulled forward as Karinai walked and talked with Yugao and Guy only chuckled as he followed after them at a more, for him, sedate pace. His eyes never left their new purple-haired companion. You're up to something Yugao, but what is it? His thoughts on the Kenjutsu practitioner would plague him the entire time the group moved through the streets and, eventually, across the rooftops until they reached the entrance to training ground 7. Who? 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 Trees made the ground shake as they fell one after the other, crumbling down and uprooting the local wildlife in a flurry of movement. Birds took to the skies to escape the crumbling foliage, bugs whizzed past their ears or hopped away, and smaller wildlife like rabbits darted to and fro from the underbrush. Those clones must like cutting down trees. Lift. Who? March. Who? The five shinobi swiftly made themselves scarce as the clones of Naruto marched past moments later, a dozen or so devoted to moving each large tree in its entirely from the training ground to someplace else. One of his centurions walked with them, his eyes darting back and forth as he lead them to wherever their destination was. Wonder what they're using all that wood for. Asuma had put out his cigarette once the quintuplet of shinobi had begun to move and now sorely wished for it back to deal with the approaching headache as his mind tried to find a reason. Man, this is going to be a drag. Don't borrow your student's catchphrase. Kurinai smiled at him as Yugao emerged from where she had hidden herself and dropped down to the floor of the forest. She motioned for the other four shinobi to follow her and they did so as she bounded through the trees. Another wordless signal brought them to a stop a few minutes later. Again. It had been easy for Kurinai to remove the Jinjutsu around the two shinobi and now the five observed from the trees. Sakura slowly rose after being hit into the ground by Kakashi, wincing as she held her stomach before she darted forward. Wisps of chakra erupted from her feet and her speed more than doubled as she threw a rather decent combination of blows forward. It was at least something a taijutsu master like Guy would appreciate as she avoided taking too strong a stance, flowing from one blow to the next and they ranged from straight jabs to kicks. Kakashi avoided her entire assault before his foot lashed out and planted itself in her chest. She went skidding back across the ground end over end, only coming to a stop when her back hit an already existing obstacle that proved insurmountable to the force of the Jonan's blow. It was one of the three wooden posts that Kakashi would have normally already tied at least one of his students to yet so far he hadn't made use of them. The Jonan lowered his foot back down slowly and crossed his arms over his chest. Again. Sakura groaned as she rose back to her feet and Guy could tell she would be nursing at least a dozen bruises tomorrow once she woke up. She nearly fell back to the ground the moment she had risen to her feet and one hand pressed against the wooden post at her side to steady herself. She took one step forward before using it as a launching point and rocketing forward. Has anyone ever told you you're a natural at taijutsu? Kakashi avoided her newest assault with ease, dodging from side to side as she unleashed blow after blow against him. Sakura didn't bother answering his question as Kakashi was actually successfully struck by her chakra-shrouded fist. He immediately exploded into a burst of smoke and the real Kakashi silently appeared behind her, a kunai held to her throat and she only released a sigh. Good natural strength by the way. Kakashi removed the deadly tool from her neck and returned it to its place at his side. You're getting better if you took out my Sha Dash, Shinaro. She struck him and he once again burst into smoke before she rose one foot into the air and brought it down with force on the ground. It simply erupted outward from the impact of her foot, blue lines of chakra racing through the growing divide between segments of earth before a silver-topped blur emerged from one and was airborne. His arms were a blur before he brought one hand to his mask and blew out a stream of water that swiftly flooded the battlefield. Sakura cried out as she was swept away in the sudden crushing wave and slammed into the lake behind her, hitting it with a great splash. You're getting pretty good Sakura. Kakashi casually crouched on the shore next to the water-logged pink-haired Jenin after she had mostly dragged herself out of the water. Just a couple days ago you would still be out in the middle of the lake. Ow. Her head fell onto the soft mud. My everything hurts. Her voice was muffled but still clear. Kakashi patted her on the back of her soaked clothes. Don't worry. That just means you're getting stronger. 
He smiled at her beneath his mask and Sakura offered a weak grin of her own even as her eyelids slowly lost the battle to stay open. That means. She yawned and drifted off before she could finish what she was saying. Kakashi slowly shook his head, no malicious intent behind it, before he drew the pink-haired Jenin up and into his arms. He ignored the way that her soaking wet clothes let water seep into his flak jacket and instead vanished in a puff of smoke. Looks like that girl isn't as weak as I thought or from what Ino told me. Asuma swiftly lit a cigarette as he spoke. If Kakashi's training her himself, she's got to have at least some talent. Good for you Kakashi. Guy couldn't help but smile after what he had seen. We shall see who has the better pupil sooner rather than later. The sound of clashing blades resounded through one of the clearings of training ground 7. Is that all you have legged? Naruto and Sasuke's blades were locked in a clash, their shields left on the ground as they battled against the strength of the other. I thought you would be better than this. I thought I would go easy on you Preter. Sasuke's red and black eyes flashed with challenge as he drew back and darted forward. Sparks flew as Naruto narrowly parried the blow before surging forward and his armored shoulder planted itself into the Uchiha's armored chest. He was thrown back but quickly recovered, rolling back onto his feet, and throwing his entire being into the next overhead swing of his sword. Naruto rose his own blade to counter and the two once again clashed, Naruto's horizontal block stopping Sasuke's vertical slash. The two struggled against each other for only a moment before Sasuke's sandal-clad foot struck out and planted itself into Naruto's armored stomach. The Uzumaki let out a grunt as he was sent stumbling back and the legate of his orange legion charged forward to press his attack when his free hand flew out and knocked his head to the side with a straight punch. His weapon came free of his grip at the suddenness of the attack. He recovered swiftly but didn't charge forward into the fray, he rubbed at his jaw with his now free hand. Naruto only offered him a smirk to the look he received and Sasuke's eyes once again flashed as he brought his fist into his palm. It looks like we're resorting to fists then. The Uchiha rolled his shoulders as he brought his hands up, balled into fists. I'll show you my hand-to-hand -hand skills then. Sasuke rushed forward and Naruto held his sword forward to meet him in a one-handed grip. The Uchiha avoided his swing and slammed into him, throwing him back, as his hands came up and took hold of his sword-bearing arm. Naruto's single arm wrestled against the might of two as his other attempted to push Sasuke away. Eventually his attacker forced his sword from his hand when he jerked it towards the ground. The blonde struggled for a moment longer before falling as Sasuke threw him over his shoulder and to the ground. As he fell, his legs crossed and his back struck the ground with Naruto's own as he tried to pull at the armbar he now had. Naruto's fingers had locked together as quickly as possible and now pulled to keep his arm from being lost to Sasuke's hold. Tricky. Naruto grinned despite the situation he found himself in. You're deceptively good Sasuke. Consider it my duty to keep you wary of me. Sasuke wrenched his hold but failed to rip Naruto's hands apart. The Praetor's strength was too much it seemed. Let me show you why I am leader of this legion. Naruto surprised the Uchiha when he seemed to effortlessly rise to his feet despite the weight of the Uchiha to one side. He failed to even stagger and with a grin he threw himself down with great force. Sasuke, to his credit, did not even consider releasing the hold. Naruto then did it again with more force. The Uchiha continued to refuse to release the hold so Naruto rose again rose to his full height. You don't know when to give up. Naruto almost felt the need to curse before he threw Sasuke onto the ground once more but this time did not rise. He forced the Uchiha to bear his full weight on his shoulders as he tried to bend him in half with his armored form. Sasuke released his hold on his arm, the Uchiha rolling to the side and coming up at his fallen sword. He drew it up into the air as Naruto chuckled as he crouched down and drew up his own blade. Both spun the tools of death in their hands and were set to begin the duel again. What's up? Kakashi wordlessly appeared between the two with his hand raised in greeting. His appearance had successfully stopped them and already Naruto's Praetorians advanced behind the blonde until a raised hand stopped them. He spoke no words but his blue eyes did not leave Kakashi's form. I need to talk to all three of you so show up at those posts I should have tied you to a while ago. He vanished without getting a response but didn't miss Naruto's chuckle. I will enjoy the day I am presented with Silver Fong's head. Naruto returned his sword to its place at his side and looked to his sparring partner. 
Inform the entirety of my glorious legion to hold their positions for now. I believe only the two of us will need to move. Of course, Preter. Sasuke's fist rested over his armored heart before he pressed a finger to his ear. Preter orders his glorious orange legion to hold their positions for now. Preter and I will speak with Silver Fong before issuing further orders. You are dismissed for now, Praetorians. Naruto looked to his personal bodyguards and as one they fell to a knee and bowed their head to him before vanishing from sight. Sasuke's Sharingan looked over the entire encounter as he walked up to his side. Let us depart, Legate. Naruto walked off without glancing to make sure the Legate of his legion was following him. He knew he was because he had no choice. Asuma Sensei, what is this meeting about? The latest iteration of the Ino Shikacho sat across from him at the restaurant they would probably become a regular presence in, Yakuniki Q. While Choji was busy roasting a good portion of the food on the table and Ino was making sure he didn't burn anything, Shikamaru asked the question that they all had. Well, you all know the Chunin exams is coming up soon, right? Asuma looked across the table at each of the capable genin placed in his hands. I'm sure you all know that guys already announced to half the village his team will be competing and I'm sure Karinai will be doing the same with her own either tonight or tomorrow morning. He offered all three a proud smile. You three are incredible shinobi and I'm not planning to have you wait for the promotion you deserve. I've got the paperwork nearly done, you three just need to sign on the dotted line. To prove his point, he withdrew the paperwork from his flak jacket and laid it down in front of them. I know you three are ready but if dash, I thought we wouldn't get the chance until next year honestly. Shikamaru flipped through the first few sheets and seemed bored with it after a while, flipping through the rest as he searched for where to sign his name. I'm glad to get such a drag out of the way now. What Shikamaru said. Choji was multitasking, focusing on both the food and flipping through the paperwork in front of him. You really didn't think we would refuse, did you? Ino almost laughed at the very idea as she signed her name on the dotted line, Choji and Shikamaru echoing her with the paperwork in front of them. If you think we're ready then we're definitely becoming Chunin. They handed them back as one. We don't intend to do anything but excel in the Chunin exams. Yeah, we'll make Chunin no problem. Shikamaru offered him a lazy smile. Besides, not making Chunin would be too troublesome for a guy like me. If you put your faith in us, we won't make you regret it. Choji gave him a resolute nod. You guys could never manage to disappoint me. The Jonin accepted the paperwork and sealed it away to turn in later. If we're being honest, I'm not worried for you three at all. I know you'll ace any exams they give you thanks to how well you work together. I'm more concerned with what you'll do to your competition. Yeah, they should be worried. Ino threw her arms over the shoulder of the boy on either side of her. Ino Shikacho is an unbeatable force when we're together. Everyone in the Chunin exams is about to learn that the hard way when we mop the floor with them. Yeah, or hopefully they all just give up and we don't have to do anything. Ino's arm tightened on Shikamaru and he nearly choked as she smiled at him. But we're definitely going to beat them all because Ino's the greatest kunoichi to ever live. Smart kid. Asuma couldn't help but compliment the genin's danger sense. Thank you Shikamaru. You're welcome, please stop choking me now. Elsewhere, teammates sat in front of their Jonin sensei. Training had just finished for the day and all three were catching their breath as Karinai debated revealing her surprise for them now or tomorrow morning. Asuma's probably already told his team, everyone in the land of fire knows guy put his team in, and Kakashi's putting in his brats, it'll be embarrassing for me to be the odd one out. Especially if their teams get promoted to Chunin and mine stay Jenin. Kurinai let out an ear irritated sigh. I've got to put them in even if I don't think they're ready. It was true that her team was capable but all three lacked in some areas. Hinata was still breaking free of her timid nature even if she was progressing by leaps and bounds in her taijutsu and usage of the Byakugan. Kurinai may have found herself disagreeing with the motivation for the change but she couldn't deny her pupil's progress. She had been growing stronger and stronger every day since she had committed herself to her training. Kiba was a monster at Taijutsu and his synchronization with Akameru for a variety of techniques ranging from tracking to sheer destruction was nothing to laugh at. His chakra reserves were impressive for a genin and his endurance was another positive. He was simply too hot-heated sometimes to effectively think. He was more prone to leap into danger than find the right approach. 
Shino was great at his clan's Haydn techniques but was lacking in many other areas where his Kikechu couldn't help him. His Taijutsu was simply the bare minimum, based around blocking and planting the bugs on his opponent. His Ninjutsu was average for his clan and his Chakra was the same for any Aburame thanks to the Kikechu. He excelled at information gathering in the end. Her team, when together and synchronized, was one of the better tracking and combat force she had seen and she had been working on developing combination jutsu with them in pairs and as a group. They had complained at first but once she had mentioned the opportunity to outclass the Ino Shikacho iteration of their generation they had been given enough motivation to focus their all on her rather strange training methods at times. Her team was great together but once the Chunin exams passed on to individual trials, she didn't feel very confident in their abilities to all pass. The type of competition they would be up against and the fatality rate of the Chunin exams were all things she had to consider. Kurinai sensei may I ask something? Hinata's soft voice snapped her out of her thoughts. The red-eyed Jonin turned her eyes away from her thoughts and towards the Hyuga. What is it Hinata? She pushed off of the tree she was leaning against as she focused on her thoughts and the meek Hyuga brought the tips of her fingers together. She had trouble making eye contact with the Jonin but that was to be expected. She was gaining confidence but it was a slow process when compared to her improvements in her skills. I, I was just wondering if, well I was wondering if we would be entered into the CH Chunin exams? She found the confidence to look her sensei in the eyes then. A fire was burning in them despite how nervous she appeared. She wanted to enter the exams. A glance to the rest of her team revealed the same fire, the same determination she would want to praise them for in any other situation. None of them wanted to be left behind by their friends, they wanted to advance to greatness together with them. They wanted to test themselves, see how strong they truly were. They wanted to represent their village, carry the will of fire through trial after trial, and carry their own pride, familial and personal, with it. Damn it. Kurinai wanted to say no to them in that instance. None of you are ready for this. None of you are ready to fight people trying to kill you, fight the monsters I know are heading into that exam but, I can't say no when you all want this so bad. I'm glad you brought that up Hinata. Kurinai let a smile cover her face as she held out her hand, the required paperwork appearing in her hand and she tossed it to each of the three genin. I finished signing all of the paperwork for entering you guys this morning and all you need to do is sign on the dotted line. None of the three noticed her smile was a bit too rigid as she watched them all, even the normally stoic and reclusive Shino, eagerly flip through the packet to find where they had to sign. Once you sign up, I'll deliver it to the Hokage office and we'll go out and celebrate. I hope I don't regret letting them do this. She didn't want any of her students to die because she couldn't tell them no. Please, let me not regret this. Team 7 was also meeting. Ha! Huh. These exams shall know the glory of the Legion when I become a champion above all champions. I shall be the one standing above all those who seek to lay claim to the title of Chunin and none shall surpass my might. There shall be no hope of defeating my glorious legion. Naruto's response to Kakashi's statement of signing them up was almost predictable. He threw his head back and laughed for nearly a full minute before speaking. When he looked to the masked shinobi his lips curled into a bloodthirsty grin that the jonin before him had seen before. Pretty much every time the Uzumaki or his clones looked at him when they thought he wasn't paying attention. They had different expressions but the same bloodlust was in them all. I will enjoy this challenge Silver Fong as it will prove to all that my Uzumaki Empire's Orange Legion marches solely with glory through all challenges and trials. Alright then. Kakashi turned to Sasuke next. What do you have to say about this, Sasuke? I shall follow Preter's glorious footsteps. Sasuke turned and saluted the Uzumaki with the customary salute of the Orange Legion. His Orange Legion shall know only the glory of triumph as he rises above all those foolish enough to act as challengers in these Chunin exams. Alright then. Kakashi replied with the same and looked to Sakura last. What do you think Pinky? I'm sure we'll be fine in the exams. Sakura didn't meet Kakashi's single visible eye and it somewhat narrowed a thing that neither Naruto's blue eyes nor Sasuke's red and black eyes missed. Sakura-chan shall be carried to glory by my glorious Orange Legion. Naruto stepped towards Kakashi with a hand falling to the hilt of his sword. All those who face myself or my team shall know the cold specter of death when the steel of my legion cuts their flesh and draws their blood. Alright then. 
Kakashi's response fell from his lips for the third time before he reached into a pocket of his flak jacket and withdrew a scroll which he tossed to Naruto and his hands slipped into his pocket. I named you team leader for that business in Nami no Kuni so the same will go for when you head into the mess they call the second stage of the Chunin exams. You three can decide amongst yourselves on who's in charge for the first stage and third stage. You have made a good and poor decision Silver Fong. Naruto turned and his Praetorians rose from where they had knelt once he had arrived. I shall be the leader of all three stages and shall be sure that all know my glorious leadership was what gave Team 7 the status of Chunin. He did not spend any more time in the training grounds with the Jonin, marching off with the Praetorians encircling himself and the legate of his Orange Legion in a sudden appearance. That went about just as I thought it would. Kakashi rubbed at his uncovered eye as Sakura stepped up to him. You three are going to have a massive target painted on your backs among the Kanoha entrance and I'm sure Naruto will do something to draw the ire of literally everyone in the exams to him. If you do make it through all the way and all become Chunin then I'm sure he will never stop bragging about it. Especially if he does beat everyone who goes up against him, something I'm partly sure he can pull off even if the deck is stacked against him. The promotion to Chunin is the decision of the Hokage in the end, right? Sakura looked up at the Jonin and he nodded and she frowned. He has a soft spot for Naruto and he's not terrible at being a shinobi when he feels like it. He also has enough chakra to support all the Kagebunshin he has to make an army. He's smart enough to command them and knows how to use them to get what he wants. Any daimyo that shows up for the third stage of the Chunin exams will be impressed with him and want to hire him to get the quantity he brings to every mission. He'll probably get an even bigger ego as a result of that. Sakura sighed as another thought came to her. He'll probably also conquer more things if he takes so many missions. His track record isn't that good for not conquering. Kakashi looked up towards the clouds as most members of a shadow using clans were prone to do and tried to find answers in them. Whatever the outcome is for Naruto, you will need to put on a good showing against whoever you go up against in the second and third stages. I'm sure Sasuke is a guaranteed chunin from what I've seen of him and that fact that he's the last Uchiha in Konoha. So the deck is stacked against me then? Sakura only received a nod from the Jonin and she managed a small smile despite the rather negative situation she found herself in. I'm sure I can manage to impress the judges, Kakashi-sensei. You're the one teaching me after all. I know. Kakashi's mask moved as he offered the world his own smile. Once you manage to get past the second stage, I'll have a month to train you against whatever opponent is unlucky enough to get matched up with you. Her smile turned a bit more sadistic then. They won't know what hit them. Her hands balled into fists at her side and Kakashi nodded. They won't. All in all, despite the large number of Genin Kanoha had that passed a rather peculiar Genin test, not a large portion of the teams entered the exams. Of all the teams that entered the most notable ones were Team Guy, a team that passed on entering last year's exams despite their skill set nearly guaranteeing promotion, Team Asuma, the current generation's Inoshikacho trio, Team Karinai, a team of heirs from the prestigious Hyuga, Feral Inazuka, and Stoic Aburame clans, and Team Kakashi, the first genin team that the Jonin in charge had ever passed. The Hokage broke out the sake to deal with the future headaches he would have to deal with thanks to the roster for the exams. Kakashi, it is great to see you arrive with such unexpected punctuality. Guy and his team had been in front of the doors for several minutes when the silver-haired Jonin had walked in with his team. It was surprising, almost heart-stopping for some cases, to see the silver-haired Jonin arrive not only not late but early. I take it from your presence here your team wishes to take part in the Chunin exams just as mine and no doubt many others? I figure the sooner they become Chunin, the sooner I can stop being a responsible sensei. Kakashi shrugged his shoulders as he walked over to his fellow Jonin along with the three armored Jenin. I'll be off the hook if they end up dying during the exams too so I have a lot of ways to win here. You should not be so morbid Kakashi. Where is your excitement at the display of the talent the current generation holds these tests and trials shall provide a mere glimpse of? I myself can hardly keep my excitement contained at the thought of what I will see. Guy offered a beaming smile as he gestured to the six genin that were between the two jonin. The genin of both my team and your own have amazing potential that we as their teachers have had the honor to draw forth. We should look upon this day with pride and, 
no matter the outcome of the exams, carry it with us for the rest of our youthful days. We were supposed to do something like that? Kakashi rubbed the back of his head as he chuckled. I kind of kept throwing missions at them until I got bored and went home. Why must your flame of youth be so dull my rival? Guy seemed almost depressed as his body seemed to fold in on itself. A dark aura briefly consumed the jonin and the genin around them took a step away. You should truly cherish the ability to draw forth the talents of your pupils. No one really explained this sensei thing to me in detail. Kakashi shrugged his shoulders once more as he patted the Uchiha on the head. But I've got a genius like Sasuke to do that stuff for me, right? He looked down to the genin that would have preferred to not have the jonin's hand on his head. The skills of Praetor's glorious legion shall reflect my skills more than my own skills ever could. Sasuke turned and threw his hand out towards Naruto. The might of his legion will be the true measurement of the skills of those foolish enough to battle against him. Really? Niji spoke up from in front of Guy, the Hyuga looking towards the Uzumaki with pale eyes that carried with them more arrogance than his stance betrayed. The former dead last is going to be what we all have to measure ourselves against? He almost laughed as he spoke. That only shows how far Kanoha has fallen to base ourselves on a failure like him. Your words have made you drift into dangerous territory Hyuga. Naruto's blue eyes were dark as he looked to the Hyuga before him. Do not imagine yourself superior to a man such as myself simply because you know a pitiful way of combat. You shall fall like all others before the glory of my legion no matter your words. They may only help you suffer greater than I originally planned before killing you. You are deluded enough to call the gentle fist pitiful? Niji sneered at the Uzumaki. The gentle fist is a tool to decide the fate of any who go against it. He stepped towards the Uzumaki and rose his hands up as he stepped into a basic stance. Do you need me to show you how powerless you are against the decider of fate? If you seek the disgrace of defeat, I shall gladly take you on. Sasuke spoke up from Naruto's side, his Sharingan flashing with challenge. It doesn't matter which of you I face. Niji had decided his opponent as his Byakugan swiftly took hold as the veins around his eyes bulged. I will defeat both of you during the Chunin exams regardless. Show him his error legged. Naruto turned away as Sasuke nodded and drew his sword from his side. Kakashi did nothing to stop the soon-to-be fight as more genin began to arrive, both from Konoha and those outside of the village. A cursory glance showed IWA, Suna, Kumo, and Kiri had sent a good handful of teams each to the exams. One of the Kumo Jonin also eyed the fight with her interest astoundingly clear to the copy ninja. Well, guy, looks like my team is fighting yours. Kakashi put his hands behind his head as he stood off to the side of the swiftly growing circle as Sasuke spun the blade in his hands before bringing the flat of the blade against his shield, letting the sound ring out around them, and Niji let out an exhale before he was a blur of motion. The shield on Sasuke's arm was thrown forward and stopped the initial flurry of gentle fist strikes and Niji withdrew as his Byakugan allowed him to analyze the Uchiha's entire stance for the obvious weakness, the shield on his arm slowed him down considerably. It also blocked his vision by a wide margin, his Sharingan rendered less effective thanks to it. The Hyuga darted forward but moved to the side, avoiding the shield as it was thrown forward to knock him off his feet. The Uchiha stood no chance to stop him now as he began his next series of blows as he swiftly turned within the Uchiha's guard. The Tenketsu in his arms were easy targets and it was even easier to seal them in rapid succession. Your arm's going numb, correct? Niji drew back as the Uchiha sword clattered to the ground from limp fingers. His Sharingan seemed to constrict, the Tomo drawing into the center, before returning to normal. It made the corners of Niji's lips move up in a smirk. I see you're having difficulty with maintaining your Sharingan as well. Your strikes are ineffective. Sasuke drove his shield into the floor and swept up his sword in his usable arm. You won't be able to strike me again. You fool. Niji shook his head, mocking the Uchiha. Fate has already decided this battle. The Hyuga began his attack again. The Sharingan followed his fingertips as Sasuke's body moved deftly avoiding each of the strikes even with his numb arm swinging beyond his control and swiftly proving itself a hassle. Damn it. He couldn't spare a glance at his arm but the Hyuga's initial attack had rendered his strategy to end the fight quickly useless. He couldn't form hand seals with one arm numb. 
He couldn't rely on his backup strategy either with his shield more of a burden than he would like to admit. I've got to end it this another way. The Uchiha pulled back, his sword spinning in the air as he threw a kunai towards the Hyuga. It was something deftly avoided as the sword was buried point first into the ground. The legate of the Orange Legion filled his usable hand with shuriken which he flung forward with accuracy befitting of the Uchiha prodigy. He looked down towards his arm in that instance and observed the developing bruises on it. He cursed as he realized just how long the Hyuga's attack on his Tenketsu had rendered it worthless. His invading chakra completely blocked the flow of his own. To break it he would need to brute force his way through the foreign chakra blocks with a surge of his own, something costly in battle as it took focus and, for a battle between shinobi, a significant amount of time. I have just the thing. His eyes left his arm as he darted forward and ripped his sword free of the ground. He charged towards the Hyuga and their eyes locked. Niji quickly closed his eyes and ran an internal scan of himself using his Byakugan. He found nothing as he avoided the Uchiha's rapid swings and the Hyuga could only internally grin as he settled into a new gentle fist stance. Fate has decided this battle at last. The Uchiha was completely open after his last swing. He was drawing his arm back and his footing left him unable to dodge his next strike. You are within range of my divination. His smile was cold as he darted forward, chakra flooding his fingertips as he ended the match. The Hyuga struck Sasuke in the chest and grinned when he looked up from it and saw the Uchiha Sharingan vanish from his eyes. Cold Black met his own right before the pommel of the Uchiha sword was driven into his skull. The pain of the blow as he stumbled back snapped him out of the Jinjutsu the Genin had placed him under. Now Dash, Sasuke allowed his chakra to surge as the Hyuga was rendered harmless for a moment, ripping away the barriers caused by Niji's initial strikes against him. Let me show you why none can stand against the might of Praetor's Legion. His hands flew through the necessary hand seals. Kuchios no Jutsu. The circle around the two very swiftly expanded when the shields of a century shoved the Watchers away. They turned inward with a shout once the task was complete and Sasuke reclaimed his shield and stood before the dazed Hyuga whose eyes tried to make sense of what he was seeing. Sasuke. Kakashi suddenly appeared in front of the Uchiha, one hand reaching out and two of his fingers poking the Uchiha's helmeted forehead. Keep an ace up your sleeve next time. He turned to Naruto next after his admonishment of Sasuke. Get rid of them. Humph. Naruto did not bother speaking as he raised a hand into the air. Instantly, the summoned clones vanished in a cloud of smoke that spread throughout the room. I would never be so foolish Silver Fong. Neither would the legate of my glorious Orange Legion. Whatever you say, Naruto. Kakashi patted him on the head as he walked off. You three probably have it all from here. The Jonin vanished in a puff of smoke. That's exactly like Kakashi. Asuma observed everything that had happened from the doorway with a small smile as his team walked into the building. Looks like he's pretty confident in what his team can do after all. The Jonin had also seen the Uchiha summon a small portion of the blonde's force. Not hard to understand why when at least two of those kids can summon an entire army if things get tough. Alright, I'm sure you three can take it from here, right? Asuma crushed the burned down cigarette under his foot. He received a trio of nods from his Jonin team and he offered the three a smile. I know you'll ace these exams so go easy on the competition, alright? No promises. Ino flashed him a smile before she grabbed hold of both Shikamaru and Choji by the arm and dragged them forward. Look out world, here comes the Ino Shikacho trio. Those kids are sometimes too crazy. Asuma shook his head with a smile before he vanished in a similar vein to Kakashi. The Jonin had a place to be after all. Remember, don't try to show off. That paints a target on your back. Kurinai stopped at the edge of the yard they would be stepping into. Keep track of each other, don't fall for tricks, and make sure to use those tricks I taught you if things get out of hand. Don't worry about us Kurinai-sensei, we're ready for this thing. Kiba's eyes shined with determination. We're going to sweep it. I hope so. She couldn't help but smile. Don't bring anything but your best, no matter what. She held out her hand and the three genin placed theirs over her own. Remember, no matter what, I'll be proud of what you three accomplish. We're going all the way Kurinai-sensei. We will accomplish this task. Why? It is because we have been given a great teacher. W we won't fail. Not a single one of us. That's my team. 
they broke away and Karinai vanished in a swirl of leaves. Remember. Let your flames of youth be bright through the darkness of challenge. Illuminate the way for others and you will find they shall do the same. The individual does not pass the exams but the group does. Guy offered his genin team a blinding smile that two of the three returned. The third was still somewhat irritated at his defeat. I shall be a bright illumination like no other, Guy sensei I know you shall Lee. But do not be afraid of following the light of others when the time comes. What the hell is going on? Even after a full year on Team Guy, Ten Ten still found herself unable to comprehend Guy at times. She did learn to smile through such confusion and think it over later. Her interests were also focused elsewhere regardless. Whatever Guy Sensei meant, I can't wait to see what else Naruto can do with those weapons. I shall look forward to hearing of your successes. Guy vanished at that through an application of his extreme speed. Fate has already decided our successes and failures. Niji whispered the words more to himself than his team. His pale eyes narrowed as they spotted an unwelcome face. Fate will decide if you live past these exams as well Hinata. Hey! Shikamaru! Choji! The voice made the two boys stop being dragged forward by Ino. They turned and not even the lazy Nara could stop himself from grinning as they saw the Inazuka running over to them. You guys are in this thing too? You bet. Choji nodded along to Shikamaru's words and Ino turned around and her eyes lit up at the sight they saw. Sasuke-kun. Ino was a blur as she raced across the room and to the armored Uchiha. The entirety of Team 7 stood separate from the other teams from Konoha and it was something the Nara noticed. Naruto's probably the cause of that. Shikamaru shared a glance with Kiba and Choji, the three silently agreeing to head over even if something else reached Team 7 before they did. Sakura-chan. Lee was suddenly in front of Sakura and it was to Naruto's obvious displeasure. I am GWOH. The genin dodged the sword that was aimed to separate his head from his shoulders. Naruto held the blade out where it had come to a stop, not bothering returning it to its sheath. Do not come before Sakura-chan. Naruto's blue eyes glared into eyes alight with challenge just as the rest of Team Guy rushed over. Lee, what do you think you're doing? Ten Ten took hold of the green-clad boy as Naruto let his sword fall back into its place at his side. His blue eyes did not leave Lee. The light of hate shined within them before his legate came over to his shoulder. Preter, he can be dealt with later. Sasuke's words only received a brief nod and Naruto turned away, his cape billowing out behind him, and he and Sasuke stepped away. Sakura, after a moment of merely looking at the two, sighed and followed after them. Once again Team 7 stood apart from the others. Naruto cast his blue eyes around the room before he whispered an order to Sasuke. The Uchiha instantly nodded and formed the same hand seals as he had against Niji in their brief battle. Kuchios no Jutsu. The Uchiha fell to a knee as he drove a hand into the ground. Instantly, smoke filled the room once more and several dozen figures similar to Naruto in appearance had joined the genin gathered in the room. Without speaking a single word, they wordlessly formed a wall with their tall shields stacked on top of each other. The click of the locking mechanism was deafening to the small group, in comparison to the other occupants of the room, of Konoha Genin. Well, that could have probably gone better. Shikamaru sighed as he and the others reached Team Guy. Sorry about how Naruto's been acting. He's not really been the same since he came back in that weird armor. There is no need to apologize. Lee's eyes drifted away from the wall of shields and he smiled at the younger genin as he offered each a thumb up. He is merely another challenge to overcome to gain the affections of Sakura-chan. You should be more worried about sasuke Kuen. Ino looked toward the wall of shields and sighed. He looks amazing in that uniform. Let's not talk about Team 7 for now. Shino spoke up as he walked over. Hello by the way. You sound almost happy Shino, what's got you so excited? Shikamaru looked to the Abure member and received the closest most would ever get to a smile. You're right that I'm excited Shikamaru. Why? It is because I find the opportunity to prove myself in the Chunin exams exciting. W we are all excited to take part in the Chunin exams. Hinata touched the tips of her index fingers together before her eyes drifted towards the division in the room. Karina sensei trained the three of us and we don't want to disappoint her. We all know we can't do that once we sweep through these exams. Kiba threw an arm over both of his teammates, Hinata almost turning red as Shino remained indifferent. 
You guys will need a miracle to beat Team 8 in this thing because we're going all the way to the end. By the time these exams end, all three of us will be Chunin. Dismissed. Who? The voice of the Uchiha and the answering cry from the clones around Team 7 drew the attention of the majority of the Genin in the room. The smoke that drifted as the clones and shields around the three Genin vanished was also enough to catch the eye of most. Without acknowledging those watching, Naruto took the lead between his two teammates and they walked through the room and out the doors. Ha! The dead last is chickening out. You're doing the right thing failure. Just like I thought, he can't handle the exams. You're never going to become a Chunin, loser. You should have never graduated. Comments like those and more came from the mouths of the Genin of Kanoha but none of them reached the Uzumaki as the door sealed shut behind him. Something's not right. Shikamaru's eyes narrowed before he turned to Hinata. Hinata, can you use your Byakugan to see where he's going? I can try. Hinata offered the Nara a nod. She rose a hand up in the unique activation seal for the dojitsu and the veins around her eyes slowly bulged. Her eyes closed as she focused and a grimace crossed her face before her Byakugan was gone quicker than it had appeared. There's a Jinjutsu obstructing something from my view. Whatever it is, it's on the second floor and there's a staircase to it behind the building. And Naruto Kuen is taking his team to whatever it is. Well that clears a couple things up. Shikamaru turned away from Hinata and to Niji. His Byakugan was silently activated it seemed. I'm guessing you figured out the same thing, Niji? Yes. His answer was a single word but it was all Shikamaru needed before he motioned for the three teams to come closer. Then I think I cracked whatever this is. He glanced up at a clock on the wall and nodded to himself before continuing. The Chunin exams officially start in 20 minutes and I've got a plan to make sure we get past the entrance exam. What's your plan? Kiba's grin was reflected on Shikamaru's face then. Five minutes later, a fight broke out between two of the members of Team Kurinai and Team Guy. It took the remainder of both teams and Team Asuma to drag the two battling Genin apart. Kiba still lunged at Niji, screaming obscenities while the Hyuga did the same. The waiting Genin cleared the way for the pack of nine to move out through the doors and a glance at the clock revealed 15 minutes until the exams began. The two Genin continued shouting at each other even after the doors had been closed. This way. Shikamaru directed the group, Niji and Kiba quickly stopping their false fight and in a few minutes the Nara opened the door at the top of the metal staircase. Hmm, it seems the Nara did catch on, leg it. Naruto leaned against the wall of the much smaller room. Sasuke nodded at his side as his Sharingan looked over the three teams. The room itself was sparsely populated by Genin and Achunin stood at the door at the opposite end of the room. Congratulations Team Asuma, Team Kurinai, and Team Guy of Kanoha. You are eligible to exempt the first stage of the Chunin exams and move on to the second stage. Remain here until I am instructed to open the door. Leaving this room before then will result in your dismissal from the Chunin exams. The Chunin spoke no more after his brief announcement. I am surprised you managed to figure out such trickery. Naruto looked to the Nine with something beyond arrogance in his blue eyes. He chuckled, throwing his head back, and truly began to laugh at something he found to be hilarious. I severely underestimated your intelligence it seems. He suddenly ceased laughing. It shall not happen again. I don't know why you're making such a big deal of it. Shikamaru rested his hands behind his head and looked towards the Uzumaki with boredom the dominate feature of his face. There are two Hyuga clan members with us so of course we were going to show up eventually. Indeed. Naruto suddenly turned to Sasuke, a smirk crossing his face. Your skills are suddenly in question legit. His tone was almost joking. Almost. Perhaps I shall have your foe from not too long ago replace you as my legate? The Byakugan seems to be superior to the Sharingan. I assure you here and now Preter, the Hyuga will never rest on the same level as the Uchiha even when only I am left of my clan. Sasuke's eyes found Nijisone and he smirked at the unspoken challenge in those pale orbs. None of their Byakugan possesses even the slightest of potential to compare to the power of my Sharingan. We shall see of course. Naruto looked to both of the Hyuga before blue eyes were fully focused on those of the blue-haired girl. Kiba noticed and growled as he moved up to her side while a dim buzzing sounded through the room. Naruto grinned at such a thing. The option shows itself more preferable every second legged. 
One of them even comes with her own personal dogs. However ill-trained they may be. That's it you bastard. You're going down now. Kiba's teeth became fangs as Akamaru dropped from his hoodie to the ground, growling, as he shot across the room on all fours. Reconsider. Sasuke spoke one word from where he stood as eyes locked with those of the Inazuka and his Sharingan spun. The Jinjutsu was performed flawlessly through the Dojitsu he possessed. Kiba at first only stumbled before fully hitting the ground, hard. Akamaru immediately leapt onto the back of his head, a soft whine coming from the Ninken before he bit down on Kiba's hand. Pain snapped Kiba out of the Jinjutsu but he didn't attack again. You as always surprise me Legget. While Naruto spoke, his blue eyes remained on the slowly turning red Hinata. You've got to be kidding me. Shikamaru couldn't believe the sight even if he knew exactly what was happening. Naruto's grin suddenly shifting to something more charming rather than arrogant made him actually want to do something about it. Stop looking at her. Surprisingly, it was Niji who stepped in front of Hinata. His Byakugan was activated and nearly instantly Sasuke was before the Uzumaki, the tomo of his Sharingan still as one hand fell to the blade at his side. No matter what you call yourself or what title you shout all the time, you are not worthy to look at the heiress of the Hyuga clan. His arms may have been folded over his chest but the Hyuga seemed ready to fight once more. The Uchiha probably saw the chakra gathering there for his gentle fist if the way he partially drew the sword was any indication of what was about to happen. Naruto, Sasuke. Sakura laid her hand on Naruto's shoulder and instantly the tension left the room. Don't fight them please, for me? Such a request is easy to fulfill, Sakura-chan. Naruto offered the pink-haired genin a half-bow and he turned to his legate. We have had enough of these trivial games, legate. We have things to discuss that lay far beyond the present. Naruto's words garnered the deactivation of Sasuke's Sharingan as he turned away from the other genin. I shall do as you wish of me Preter. He saluted the Uzumaki with his fist placed over his armored heart. Of course you shall. Naruto clapped Sasuke on the shoulder and the two walked away. Sakura sent an apologetic glance to the genin that she wanted to approach before walking off after the two. The sound her sandals made echoed in the silent room. This all just got too troublesome. Shikamaru looked up towards the ceiling, avoiding the look sent towards him by the more curious genin. He knew he was going to hate everything he was about to do today. It is a great thing to see so many promising young shinobi have advanced this far in the chunin exams but, regrettably, this number is far too high to advance to the third stage. Hiruzen stood before the genin that had made their way through the forest of death. To lower the numbers, and the matches that will comprise the final stage, preliminaries will be held in this arena. This is unfortunate. Naruto's grin never wavered as he took in the Hokage's words. He disliked the information being dropped on him so suddenly but he was nothing if not adaptable to changes such as these. He and his legate would not fail, the orange legion he had created would not be disgraced. They shall only rise above such a petty and simple challenge and find further glory at the end of the road they traveled on. Their opponents would only know the hollowness of a crushing defeat. He would accept nothing less from both his legate and himself. Sakura-chan. Naruto drew the pink-haired genin's attention to him as he held out his hand. To prevent you from wasting your time with trash, I can give you the seal to summon a fragment of my legion to your side anytime you wish. They will certainly prove helpful in dealing with your opponent in the preliminaries. I appreciate that Naruto but you don't have to. Sakura gently pushed the offered hand away. I've been training so that I can take on anything these exams throw at me. I insist you rethink that. Naruto returned his hand to its prior place at his side and he glanced towards the screen displaying the fights. Neither his nor his legate's opponents mattered as they would easily be vanquished, but he did somewhat worry for Sakura-chan. I see that you're going up against Ino, I doubt you will have trouble when it comes to defeating one so reliant on others but it is always best to be certain. Teamwork is vital Naruto, you shouldn't insult someone for having it when those three are very effective together. Sakura looked at the screen as well and could only raise a pink eyebrow at one of the matchups that she would definitely be paying attention to. Kiba's going up against Chino? I wonder how those two are going to fight each other. Their teamwork fails against the discipline of my magnificent legion. None shall surpass my power. Naruto turned to Sasuke as the Uchiha took notice of the board and his opponent. Legate. Preter. 
Immediately the Uchiha snapped his eyes over to the Uzumaki and saluted him with a fist over his armored heart. What do you command of me? I expect an easy victory over someone such as her. Naruto spoke no more as he turned and left the arena. Sasuke Uchiha and Kintsuchi remain here. The rest of you can wait for your matches above. Hei 8 stepped to the center of the arena and briefly coughed into his hands as the armored Konoha Genin and Odo Genin walked up to either side of him. This match is. His words were lost to Naruto as he ignored the sickly looking man. Let me see your true skills now Legit. I do not wish to be disappointed in a choice that I was so sure of that day. Naruto laid a hand on the hilt of his sword as his blue eyes stayed locked on the battle below him. Sakura was at his side and she looked on almost as attentively. Please don't die, just get hurt really bad. You should give up now you know. Kin's hands were filled with three senban each once the Tokubetsu Jonin had begun the match and removed himself from the field. He could be seen standing on the large hands and arms off to the side of the arena. The genin from Odogekyur sneered at the Uchiha who hadn't moved once the match had begun. I know all your tricks so do dash, be quiet. The Sharingan warped his coal black eyes to red and black. I'm considering sparing you but if you don't learn to be quiet I may just decide against it. You're too arrogant for your own good, Uchiha. Kin threw three senban forward and the Uchiha dodged them without issue, moving his body to the side before he raised his hands and the movements of them were clear. They were a staple of any fight with a member of the Uchiha clan, be it during the Warring States period or less than a decade ago, all members made use of the technique. Katan, Gokaku no Jutsu. He breathed out a massive fireball that Kin dodged by leaping out of the way. He continued weaving hand signs as she was airborne and he dashed to the side, using the sheer mass of the fireball to stay hidden from her sight in addition to the flames obscuring his hands from sight. The moment Kin landed from when she had leaped into the air, she narrowly ducked under a barrage of shuriken the Uchiha had thrown at her. She responded with another trio of Sunban that he batted out of the way by drawing his sword. The ringing of bells briefly came to his ears but he ignored them in favor of bringing the hand holding the wire strings up and moving through a number of hand signs. Snake. DRA what the hell is going on? His red and black eyes widened in shock when the image of one Odo Genin multiplied into a dozen. Jinjutsu? He released the wire strings and stumbled back as the ringing once again came but this time it brought pain. He closed his eyes as the sound seemed to vibrate his bones and turn them to powder. What the hell? When did she manage to do this? Ha, you were all talk and no bite. Kin drew more Sanban to fill her hands and threw them forward, Sasuke unable to even know they were coming. They struck his hand and, unwillingly, his sword fell to the ground with a clatter. He stumbled when he attempted a step towards the Kunoichi and instead ended up nearly falling when he heard the ringing in rapid succession around him. He could hardly keep his head straight with the sudden feeling of vertigo washing over him as the Kunoichi refilled her hand. So much for the Uchiha being legendary and powerful shinobi. You can't even handle my Jinjutsu. I need to finish this. The red and black eyes of the Uchiha, even if unfocused, made Kin want to end the fight quickly. Another trio of Sanban filled her free hand and she threw all six forward, the Uchiha seemingly noticing it. Which are real. He only saw a swarm of Sanban fly towards him, a near solid wall of needles that he had no idea how to avoid as the constant ringing only doubled the number. Can't figure it out like this. The Uchiha rushed through hand signs he had memorized with his Sharingan instead of trying to dodge. Dotan, Doria Hiki. The stone beneath him surged upward as a wall that concealed him from the Kunoichi site. The Uchiha was somewhat grateful that he had fought Kakashi as he did on the day of the bell test. It was the reason he hadn't lost the fight then and there. The disgrace to the Legion his defeat would bring would ensure that Naruto changed his mind when it came to his decision in Nami no Kuni. It will go unnamed for today. Sasuke knew how quickly such a thing could change. The technique he had used took a healthy chunk of his chakra to perform in the end, regardless of how well he had copied the hand signs for it. He was almost panting with each breath he took and he estimated he had lost roughly a fourth of his chakra by making use of it. The near nausea he was feeling from the Jinjutsu hadn't helped him with his chakra management in the slightest. Normally he could regulate his use much better, especially when his Sharingan was active. Now to deal with the bells she's using. 
The Achiha Sharingan, as it roamed around the arena, easily discovered the bell's kin had been feeding her chakra to and he drew a number of shuriken out to deal with them before making his next move. What's the matter, can't take me on? Kin didn't waste her sunban on the stone the Uchiha remained hidden behind. She ran chakra down the strings attached to her fingers instead of approaching the Uchiha and was startled when no ringing answered the chakra flow. It didn't take her long to notice the wire strings had been cut by shuriken from the Uchiha. The wall decided to crumble then and the Uchiha was nowhere to be found once it did so. Where are you? Kin was cautious as her eyes looked for the Uchiha before a sneer crossed her face. She had a plan. The sunban in her hands had bells attached to them and could be triggered by chakra flow either in her hand or out it. All she needed to do was lure the Uchiha out to be sure she caught him. She had just the way to. Too scared to face me? I can't believe people were actually supposed to think you were strong. You can't fight me now even if I'm going easy on you. You're just some weak brat. You're so weak that your psycho of a brother didn't even bother to kill you. Sasuke paused. The genin was underneath the Odogekyo shinobi and was about to use another move he had copied from Kakashi and end the match when her words had reached him. Memories he had thought he had buried to fuel his hate for the man he would kill came to the forefront of his mind. He knew he could end the battle now. He could come up beneath her and trap her in the ground and force her to submit. It was his plan to end the match before she had done it. She had brought up the man he had promised to kill. She had made him remember the blood-soaked streets. She made him remember the massacre wrought by one man. She made him remember the torment of the last meeting he had with a fellow Uchiha. She made him remember Itachi Uchiha's last words to him. You're not even worth killing. Foolish little brother, if you wish to kill me, foster your hatred and despise me. Surviving, in such an unsightly manner as this, by all means flee. Cling to your wretched life. You're calling me weak, huh? The Uchiha laughed and it was audible to everyone. It came from below Kin and she leaped away, landing a fair distance away with her sunban ready to throw. The ground crumbled away as the Uchiha rose from beneath it. If I'm weak like you say, what does that make you when you're on the ground begging for mercy? Idiot. Kin threw her sunban forward, chakra already running down the strings. He let himself get drawn out. All I need to do is hit the bells with chakra when they're close enough and he's done for. This was almost too easy. What does Lord Orochimaru want from a guy like him? Your bells are your one trick, aren't they? The Uchiha's eyes focused on the chakra racing down the strings before he threw out another handful of shuriken. Once again, the wire strings were cut but the Uchiha didn't wait for the Kunoichi to realize such a thing. He was already moving forward at speed she couldn't follow. He was in front of her before she could react and he grabbed hold of her scarf, drawing her forward. She didn't act quickly enough and the Uchiha locked eyes with her. Let me show you a real Jinjutsu now. The world changed. He wasn't trying to distract her or confuse her senses. He wanted to terrorize her. The light, however harsh it was, vanished for a moment for complete darkness to take its place before light returned. It was blood red. He was torn apart in a shower of blood before her eyes and kin rapidly backpedaled. The ground the crimson ichor touched burned away and it was spreading, it ate away at the ground like acid. Only the void was left once it was done and Kin ran from it or at least tried to. She screamed when she saw something had grabbed her, holding her in place. She tried to struggle but the grip grew crushing and she collapsed to the ground. She fell just as the floor around her began to crumble. She was left in the center of an island that was already eroding. Things reached over the side then, skeletal hands dragging up monstrosities that she knew were coming for her. They crawled over the side no matter how much she screamed, she couldn't free herself from the crushing vice no matter how hard she struggled. They were dragging her across the floor, covering her, ripping at her flesh. The blood, the acid, it bit at her skin with each time they touched. The skeletons that had crawled out of the darkness were tearing her apart, demonic grins on their horned skulls while clawed fingers ripped her flesh away. She tried to struggle but her body refused to cooperate, refused to obey her command. She was trapped and could only scream when the hands reached for her face at last. They didn't tear at it through, they didn't claw at it, they did nothing. They merely forced her to look at the red eyes hanging high above her. They forced her to see the rain of blood begin. Crimson ran like rivers down to where she was forced to watch and consumed her, washed her away and into the void. Her back hit the stone once the Uchiha released his hold of her scarf, 
Kin's eyes wide with terror as the Uchiha stared down at her with the Sharingan that had effortlessly trapped her in the monstrous illusion. She was paralyzed at the mere sight of the eyes and the Uchiha smirked at her. That was a real Jinjutsu. He took a single step towards her and she found herself crawling back on her hands. He took another step and she tried to scramble up to her feet when she discovered they had been bound together with wire strings. I'm not very good at it, even with a Sharingan. He pulled the wire strings wrapped around his hand taut by raising it. I much more prefer ninjutsu. He slowly moved through the hand signs he would need, the same ones he had rushed through near the start of the match. Snake. Dragon. Rabbit. Tiger. He raised the bundle of strings up to his mouth as Kin glanced around her at the shuriken and searched for her sunban with her free hands. The attempt was fruitless as he ninja pouch was tossed aside, its content strewn across the arena floor. It didn't take a genius to understand exactly what was about to happen. What the hell are you doing? That guy said no killing. Kin struggled to pull away but the Uchiha was stronger than he looked, his arm didn't move no matter how much she struggled. She only succeeded in letting the strings bit into her legs. Blood began to run down the wire and the sight of it terrified her. Stop. I give up. You win. I give up. Katan, Ryuka no Jutsu. A massive flame roared down the wire strings as Kin screamed. Swayton, Mizurapa. Steam rose as the water struck the flames. That was pretty impressive Sasuke. Kakashi stood with Kin thrown over his shoulder as the steam brought on from the two attacks meeting dispersed throughout the room. I'm sure you were just using that last attack as a scare tactic since lethal force was expressly forbidden, right? I thought Jonan couldn't get involved, Kakashi. Why get in my way when I was about to finish the match? Hiate's sword had severed the strings binding Kin and the Tokubetsu Jonan side from where he stood behind the Uchiha. The match was over once she started shouting about giving up. The proctor for the preliminaries turned to the watching audience. Sasuke Uchiha wins his preliminary match. Naruto offered a one-man round of applause for his legate then, his smile wide at his display, and the ovation was something the legate accepted with a salute to the Uzumaki. He left as Kakashi resisted the urge to rub away the growing migraine the team was causing him. I'm going to need a drink after this. The masked jonin sat the Odogekyo Genin down in front of her team and vanished over to his three students, two in name only, without a word. Sakura Haruno and Ino Yamanaka are to come down to the arena. Hei once more stood in the center of the room after a brief set of hand signs to return it to normal. The same rules I spoke before apply to this match and any match. Killing your opponent is not allowed. If you attempt to do so, you will be stopped. The shinobi sounded tired as he spoke something he thought he didn't need to. Don't make me have to repeat that again. Well, I guess I'm up then. Sakura turned to leave the balcony. Sakura-chan. Naruto took hold of her arm before she could step away from him. Sasuke stood on her side but his eyes were elsewhere. His Sharingan roamed over the balcony they all waited on and he spotted his opponent being attended to by medical Nin. Before you leave to fight, I must know for certain that you understand something very important. Blue eyes that usually looked at her with nothing but adoration held nothing in them. You are not as delicate as I once thought, you are quite capable, far beyond what I once thought. You stand above those below you with not only your beauty but your skills as well but Yamanaka is not to be treated lightly. She holds the advantage of a powerful clan over your own. She will use heightened techniques you will have no counters to. She will attempt to destroy you with skills taught to her by Shinobi the rank of Silver Fong but it makes her weak. Do not fail to impress me with your showing. As he spoke, his grip on her arm tightened ever so slightly. The idea of seeing you defeated by such a girl as Ino Yamanaka is something I hardly wish to imagine. The reality of it. He released her. I would not like the actions I would need to take then. Don't worry about me. Sakura offered the blonde a smile that brought an identical one from him as well. I'll be fine down there. Neither spoke on the other's smile. Sasuke's eyes followed Sakura as she headed down to the arena and he nodded to Naruto. The Uzumaki grinned as he leaned forward on the railing sat before him. Now all he had to do was wait and see if it was truly necessary in the end. You are quite devious, Preter. Sasuke's comment brought a brief chuckle from the Uzumaki as Sakura's pink head appeared below the two as she walked across the floor to where the platinum blonde Ino waited for her, impatiently tapping her foot. 
I don't know if Sakura will like the surprise you gave her. Sakura-chan's safety is more important than whatever she may feel from what I do to ensure it. Naruto seemed to hand wave away the words of his legate. I will not see such a delicate flower perish because of the harshness of what surrounds it. Of course, Preter. Sasuke did not speak anymore on the topic. Both turned their focus towards the fight below them, it seemed. This has to stop soon. Kakashi leaned back against a wall behind the two armored genin as he looked down at his, in truth only, student with more pride in his eye than he thought he would ever have. Don't let them get to you, Sakura. Show them all how much you've grown since you've come back. Ino. Sakura. The two Kunoichi stood across from each other as the proctor quickly vanished from sight and back to the other side of the arena where he sat down. I am not going to be between that. Hey 8 settled his back against the wall and merely observed the two genin. This isn't going to be pretty. He could feel the tension between the two genin, the animosity that could only be born from a friendship that had been lost. These two hate each other. So, how does it feel? Ino put a hand on her hip, throwing her long blonde hair back with her free hand. Sakura looked at her for a moment before she turned red. T that doesn't matter right now, Ino. She was flustered and was stammering as she drew out a kunai from her ninja pouch. We're supposed to be fighting. Not talking about stuff like that so fight me. I'll fight you when I want to. Now tell me about what it's like being on a team with Sasuke Kuen. The Yamanaka's eyes blazed with fury as a kunai was drawn from behind her back as well. If it comes to it, I can just beat it out of you too forehead. Do the right thing and I won't embarrass you too much. Don't think so high of yourself Eno Pig. Sakura dashed forward with speed that made Eno's blue eyes go wide before the Yamanaka swiftly avoided the rapid swipes from Sakura's kunai before it was suddenly spinning in the air. She was confused for only a moment before she noticed the airborne Sakura forming a hand sign and she swiftly leaped back. The explosive tag exploded just as she did so and she shielded her face from shrapnel. What a dirty trick, forehead. Ino landed on her feet and added a kunai to her other hand as she crouched on the ground. It wasn't that good of one either now that I think about it. You probably learned it from that idiot on your team. So what did you teach Shikamaru and Choji then? Sakura asked her question as she threw a handful of shuriken forward and dashed after them, weaving hand signs for a technique any student at the academy, barring one Naruto Uzumaki, could perform easily. You've got too big of a mouth on you now, forehead. Ino watched as one Sakura turned into three in a jumbled mess, the three constantly crossing each other's path as she dashed to the side and threw a trio of kunai forward. I'm going to like shutting you up. Why take a chance when I can be certain? Her kunai struck each of the three simultaneously and the kunoichi grinned as she came to a stop and prepared to end the battle here and now. I've got you right where I want you Sakura. Sakura knocked aside the kunai sent at her with one of her own as her bunshin failed to keep up the illusion any longer. She rushed through another set of hand signs but she heard hissing at her feet. Say goodbye. Ino formed the needed hand sign and the explosive tags she planted when she landed from Sakura's own use of the ninja tool exploded. She was consumed by the blast and the platinum blonde smirked as her hands formed a unique seal out in front of her chest. This is it. Ino could already see how the battle would end. Sakura would emerge from the smoke cloud, trying to close the distance between the two of them as quick as possible, it would be worthless thanks to the wire strings laying taut between two kunai, she would use the Yamanaka's mind-body switch technique to take control of Sakura's body once she was tangled in her trap. Once she had successfully completed the jutsu, it would be easy to make Sakura give the match up. You never stood a chance against me forehead and you should have known it. This is interesting, don't you think Kakashi? Hmm? The jonin turned to the smoker next to him. The two had seemed to gravitate towards one another as their two female students did battle. What do you mean, Asuma? I mean, don't you think this matchup is interesting? Asuma looked down at the two genin, Ino ready to end the match. It's a bit cruel putting an heiress like Ino up against a girl like Haruno. Well, if I didn't know you any better Asuma, I'd say you were insulting my student. Kakashi turned a lazy eye towards the bearded jonin. I'm hearing you wrong, right? You can hear whatever you want. Asuma blew out a cloud of smoke that hung in front of him. You can believe that your kid can beat Ino but you'll be disappointed. 
Kakashi's eye became more focused than it should when directed at a fellow Konoha shinobi. She was smart at the academy, top of the class thanks to her test scores. She's hopeless against someone like Ino. She wasn't the smartest but she's going to wipe the floor with the kid. The bearded Jonin let his cigarette hang from his lip. Some kids aren't meant to be shinobi, it's better she figure that out now than later. Kakashi said nothing. I'm just trying to make sure she doesn't go out there and die, Kakashi. Don't hate me for trying to keep a kid not ready for this safe. You're wrong. He said no more. Now. Ino saw movement coming from the smoke. A barrage of kunai and shuriken flew towards her before she could get the perfect shot but it was no problem to dodge for a kunoichi like her. A pink-topped blur darted out of the smoke next, Ino effortlessly drawing twin kunai into her hands and deflecting Sakura's own. The genin grinned for whatever reason as they fell away from each other, launching back to the ground. Ino realized why when she caught sight of the wire strings tied to the shuriken she had dodged. Sakura pulled them back before she landed but it wasn't hard to deflect them with her two kunai. I bet you learned that trick from Sasuke Kuen, forehead. Ino moved the kunai she held in each of her hands, spinning them by the ring at the end of them on her fingers. What else did he teach you? She laughed as she sprinted forward. Not like it'll help you beat me so don't bother copying him anymore. I don't need to copy him. Sakura blocked her slashes with the ninja tool with her own. She attacked herself when Ino showed her surprise but didn't manage to get through her guard. She did manage to gain distance between the two a moment later and tossed one of her kunai towards Ino. It was something the Yamanaka easily dodged. Leg it. Naruto's single word earned a nod from the second in command of his forces. He wordlessly vanished in an impressive use of the body flicker technique for a genin. A centurion promptly appeared kneeling next to Naruto with ten of the men of his century with him. Preter. The centurion of the Orange Legion rose and the two near-identical figures observed the match below them. The absence of the legate was not commented on. What is he up to? Kakashi's eyes did not leave the match below him but his thoughts turned towards the Uchiha. What is Naruto planning now? Give up already. Ino kicked Sakura after the next clash proved less even. She was sent rolling across the ground but swiftly rose to her feet and reached into her ninja pouch. Ino threw a barrage of shuriken forward and forced her to reconsider whatever her plan was. You can't beat me forehead. You're the same now as you were back in the academy. No I'm not. Sakura leaped back as she landed, doing a trio of kunai Ino had thrown at her. If anyone is, it's you. I was better than you back then and I still am. Ino's smoke bombs, tied to the kunai, detonated and Sakura coughed in the cloud of choking smoke. Her hands formed a familiar sign, the signal that use of her clan's infamous mind-body switch technique was imminent. You didn't have what it took to beat me then and you don't have anything close to it today. Now give up or dash, a sudden surge of chakra made her almost fall. That's it. Kakashi's eye did not widen in surprise at his discovery as he turned his single visible eye to the blonde in front of him. The Uzumaki chuckled as the centurion was swiftly replaced by the legate of his Orange Legion. He dash, bow to the might of the Orange Legion. Sakura was behind a wall of steel, the arena floor filled with a century of the Orange Legion. Prepare to fall Yamanaka. Hey 8, disqualify her. Asuma called out to the proctor who didn't bother with responding. He merely turned to the Hokage. I'm going to regret this but? The opportunity to gather more data was rare. He could sense the mark burning on Sakura's arm, Naruto's chakra ripping free of it. He had made tough decisions before, decisions that cost hundreds their lives, but he had never had to deal with the look of his son when he made them. He didn't have to see how he accused him, another failing that was simply one of many now. He didn't have to see his son look at him like he was now, already knowing what his father would say. I never outlawed summoning, Asuma. Hiruzen sealed Ino's fate in that moment. Stand back, Sakura-chan. Allow us to handle it. The centurion that had been summoned with his force drew his sword up, clashing the flat of the blade against his shield. Sakura's attempted protest was drowned out by the noise that grew hundredfold when the clones around her joined the beat. Ha! Huh. I'm not afraid of a bunch of shadow clones from that idiot up there. Ino threw shuriken but the wall of steel repelled them, the projectile weapons clattering to the ground once they met the shields. You must be desperate to try and dash, I grow tired of her voice. Take her down. Who? Damn it. 
Sakura ignored the clones that ran past her. I didn't want this. She ignored the centurion that stood next to her, his armor easy to recognize as the leader of her Blossom Guard. The same Blossom Guard she thought was destroyed when she took on Zabuza Momoichi in Nami no Kuni. She was clearly wrong. They had been butchered by the hired shinobi until Naruto had arrived. Why do they have to be here? Why are they treating me like I'm some delicate flower? Her eyes turned to pools of blue watching from above. It's because of him. She had too much control of herself to glare at him. It wouldn't work anyway. If, after everything she had done to him at the academy, he still had his crush on her then she couldn't break his obsession over her with a mean look. She would need to do something far more drastic to get him to leave her alone. How am I supposed to do that if he put this stupid mark on my arm? It was easy for her to feel the seal on her arm now. It all but blazed with Naruto's chakra, consumed her entirely in a near shroud that she hated. His chakra wasn't vile or hate-filled, it just proved how obsessed he was with her. He had, for whatever reason, developed a seal to put on people that forcibly summoned his clones. How am I even going to get this thing off of me? Pylum thrust forward with blinding speed, all but caging Eno between the ten wooden shafts. She somehow managed to escape but already blood ran from a number of cuts and, from the grin on the faces of the clones, they were playing with her. None of them had seriously engaged her beyond ten of them. The rest merely encircled her, acting as a steel wall she couldn't get past. They banged on their shields with their swords, stomped their feet on the ground, brought the shaft of Pylum against the towering shield on their arms, and shouted and hollered at her but they did not attack. Who? Eno failed to dodge the next Pylum, crying out as the blade at the end ran across her arm. She grabbed at it with her lips in a tight line before lashing out with a kick. A shield met her foot and she was sent stumbling back when the clone behind it shoved the shield forward. Who? She recovered before she could fall, planting her foot down and trying to burst through the small circle the ten made around her with a surprising display of speed. Who? The pylum of five of the nearest clones were thrust forward, Eno coming to a hasty stop to avoid being impaled on the sharp points. She turned and ran to the side, failing to dodge the next pylum thrust in its entirety and suffering a cut on her side. Who? Three shot forward from around her, hoping to cage her in a rough triangle that they would tighten. They failed when she hopped onto the shafts of two of the pylum, balancing there for a moment until a fourth struck her in the shin with the shaft of the pole arm. She nearly lost her balance as she felt the impact she knew was unavoidable. She wanted to scream but instead her foot lashed out, her sandaled foot almost succeeding in striking the clone underneath his chin if he hadn't moved back in time. Who? The three that had aimed to trap her in the triangle let out a shout as they threw their weapons upwards, launching the balancing Eno surprisingly high into the air. She tried to control her descent, tried to avoid the bed of spikes that awaited her. She couldn't. The clones angled their weapons away from her, allowing her to strike the center of a new circle. They were still playing with her from the grin on their faces. Why can't I show him how strong I am? Sakura caught sight of the silver hair of her teacher, the one man she wanted to impress in this fight. Now she couldn't. Now he had to be sure that it was a waste of time to train her, to even bother with teaching her. Why does Naruto have to get in my way? He had to know then. It was the only option. He had to know that she hated him, hated how he had become obsessed with her, obsessed with treating her like some prize, and decided to show her why she didn't stand a chance. She couldn't escape his sight, his reach, with the mark on her arm. She doesn't seem appreciative of the gift, Preter. Sasuke's Sharingan did not leave Sakura, focused on the mark that continued to pump out chakra, Naruto's chakra, on her arm. What does this mean for the future plans you developed? It changes nothing. Naruto chuckled as he clenched and unclenched his hand, the same hand he had grabbed hold of Sakura with. I am the Caesar of the Uzumaki Empire. She will learn to appreciate my interest in her soon enough. She doesn't really have a choice. She can't get rid of that mark. The mark on his palm, hidden by his armor, burned bright. At the same time, a grin of conquest was clear on Naruto's face. She belongs to me like all of this world soon will. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.